Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Brandon Cantino. Brandon is a co-founder and the CEO of Four Growers. Brandon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to have you. It's been a while since we've caught up, so uh, it's just grateful for you coming over for dinner and uh, fun to have you on the pod. Yeah, it's great to catch up. It's been too long. Absolutely. So uh, for people listening, Brandon and I both went to Pitt, and so we, we know each other from those days. And how did we meet even? Like, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember, to be honest. It was definitely, I think, maybe five years ago. And I think we were talking earlier. I really remember yeah. you introduced me to sous vide. Nice. And uh, that changed my life. It might have been Pittsburgh Robotics Network, like thinking about it. Like, I feel like it, probably it, could, was. Have, it could have been that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, dude, tell me, tell me about sous vide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best. Great way to cook truck roast, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Five, five bucks a pound, pal. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So what is Four Growers up to these days? I know you guys were always doing tomato harvesting, but it's been a while since I kind of checked in with the company, embarrassingly. I, I should have done better diligence. I'm sorry, Brandon. No worries. Not a problem. <laughs> Yet uh, Four Growers, uh, we're building robots to feed the world. And so as you mentioned, for us, that really began is uh, doing tomato harvesting robotics. And when we talk about tomatoes, these are really the cherry and grape tomatoes that you'll eat at the store. So there's really kind of small snacking tomatoes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the point we're now, uh, we've deployed and we're picking, I think we've done over 200,000 of these tomatoes that we've picked and sold in stores. Uh, so there's a good chance uh, anyone here who's in, uh, in Pittsburgh may have actually uh, eaten a tomato that we've picked with our machine. That's awesome. Thank you. What label do you guys sell under, just so I can look for them next time I'm in Giant Eagle? Yeah, so we have a couple different customers. Uh, one that's public is uh, we do work with Nature Fresh. Uh, so if you see Nature Fresh in the store, that's oh, cool. one of them. That's awesome. I'll have to look for those. Nature Fresh, uh, get your robotic tomatoes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Can't promise they're all robotically picked today, but yeah. uh, we're getting there. Nice. So why, why pick this problem? Like, why focus on tomato harvesting? Yeah, it's a really uh, long journey. Uh, so kind of the, the shorter version of it is I was really interested in water quality uh, when I was at university, built my own Internet of Things water quality sensor, learned about water scarcity from that. And when you learn about water scarcity, you learn that agriculture is the number one user of all of our freshwater resources. I just got really interested in how can we improve the food system to become more water efficient. Uh, my co-founder, Dan, he started a hydroponics club, grew lettuce hydroponically cool. uh, for local food banks. We were actually looking at starting a vertical farm, uh, but couldn't really build conviction behind the economics of a vertical farm, at least in the near term, and shifted into greenhouse farming, which, to be honest, five years ago had no idea it even existed. And so these greenhouses can be 200 acres all under glass. Seriously? Uh, and, yeah, they're massive operations. Like the first time I saw What is that in square feet? Just like for like... Square feet, I don't know. Oh, no worries. Uh, I think it's, it's like a... 130 football fields though. So that's why. Okay. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> these are huge. Good, good amount of space. <laughs> operations. Yeah, when I thought greenhouse, I always thought like these plastic high tunnels, like the small things you see on the highway. Not that at all. There's like this whole other industry of greenhouses that are these glass houses and they're super efficient and sustainable the way that they grow. They're over 90% more water efficient than your traditional field farming. Imagine the power bill's lower than an indoor vertical farm. Yes, power bill is much lower than an indoor <laughs> vertical farm. Carbon footprint's much lower than a vertical farm. Uh, land efficiency, though, is still very efficient. I think it's 25 times what you'll see in an open field. Oh, wow. And so we were just amazed. Like, this is okay. Vertical farming, we weren't totally sure if like in the near term this was the way. But these glass houses, they've been doing it for half a century and proven How it is works. It more efficient than an outdoor farm? Yeah, the way it's more efficient is they grow hydroponically and they recirculate the water. Oh, cool. So in the outdoor farm, you'll kind of spray and pray. It evaporates. You have to spray and pray again and everything's moving around. And in these greenhouses, uh, you get to recirculate. And nothing gets wasted. So you've still got that, you know, whatever, like chemist, you know, level of control, but you're using sunlight instead of. Exactly. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and you you have these situations too where you have the same like kind of a bio protocol. So you have these healthy pests instead of pesticides. So you can have kind of better grown food that doesn't have the same kind of chemicals that you might when see you in an open healthy field. pests. I, I had a friend who worked in the marijuana industry uh, up in Ontario, and she was telling me they would release these little like almost microscopic bees that would like sting 
Is it stuff like that that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. They literally they have these. I probably shouldn't call it pests because I think that the bio people in this field would kill me if I call them pests. <laughs> they're they're healthy biologicals. Oh yeah, uh, that's, the term. that's the buzzword <laughs> Randy used. <laughs> and uh, and what they do is yeah, it's basically it, it creates an ecosystem inside the greenhouse. So you put in these uh, these different bio biologicals. One of them is like uh, persephilis, and it will end up eating the the pests. And cool. so it just is a way to kind of maintain pest population. And it naturally balances because if you have a lot of pests, then your biologicals eat more, they produce more, and then you get more biologicals to counteract it. And, and then, then when they versa. deplete the population, whatever's killing your crops, they probably go down naturally because they have a smaller food supply and it sort of symbiosis is out. Yep, exactly. Because symbiosis is a word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally, totally. <laughs> Sorry, high school English teacher. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So that's um, that's really, really cool. I mean, I'm guessing you could do it with pesticides if you wanted to, but it's just, you know. Yeah, you could, but uh, it's yeah. nice if you don't have to. It creates yeah, a sure. better quality, not as much spraying. And, and so. so the reason for that is just because, like you said, the ecosystem's contained. So if you were to do this outdoors, the biologicals would get out and... You know, exactly. it just wouldn't really make sense. Yeah, they'd be they'd get out. The other thing too is greenhouses; they're so much more concentrated. Uh, so if you were to try to deploy biologicals across like a hundred hectares, uh, which is I guess would be what is hectares and acres? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, two point four seven. <laughs> I think it is is uh, acres in a hectare. But for the point of this, we can say say you have like a uh, hundred acres. Yeah. Uh, versus in a greenhouse, that would be like four acres. Okay. The amount of food production you can get. So it's a lot more realistic, too, that you could deploy biologicals on four acres as opposed to 100 acres. So it's both that you get the so you containment. You can still do it. You just got to dump them. Like it's, you, yeah, you're basically changing them. the yeah, environment and, they could go and away, the area where it could fly. Yep. And I'm, I don't know if this is true or not, but just hypothetically, I mean, is there any chance you might screw up the ecosystem around you know, your farm where you do that? Because you'd release like a predator you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah to be honest i don't know for sure but i yeah. would imagine yes you probably could yeah so. that's fair <laughs> I, I i'm so dumb like i'll ask a lot of kind of first order questions so this is this is all really fun no worries not dumb at all it's a very uh, it's very good to hear you think about the the second order effects a lot of times people will uh do things and not think about the second order effects so yeah for sure good to have people <laughs> like you <laughs> Yeah, they should put me in charge of everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Everything would be very well thought out. It'd yeah, be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Sporadic is, is how I think. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what what sort of things are you guys working on these days? Like any new developments or just kind of continuing to take more market share and develop the products? Um, can I ask like what sort of production quantities you guys are in? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we do have other developments. So we've actually proven that our system is not just a tomato harvesting robot. Uh, last year, we were able to prove that it's actually multi-crop. Oh, cool. uh, so we've really been able to prove out we've built a harvesting platform. And That's awesome. so what we were able to do is we could basically take the same AI that we developed for perception, the same methodologies, kind of novel motion planners we used. And then we took that and we just built a new data set for a new crop, swapped out the gripper or the end effector that we use. And very quickly, we were able to harvest our second crop which i can't say what it is yet but uh it was pretty cool to see that we did in <laughs> fact build a, a platform and not just a, a tomato harvesting robot my money's on strawberries <laughs> <laughs> anyway no that's awesome uh that's that's really really cool so that means then the, the way you're picking tomatoes and mystery crop why is that you're just gripping them and throwing them in, in a hopper how exactly does the mechanism work and is there footage of this we can pull from to put out for this podcast because that'd be fun yeah, uh, I left a little bit of a pause. So this will air at the end of April. So by then these videos will go out. So okay. I'll answer as if like they're already out there. Okay. All right, yeah. So uh, what we do is we actually use a, a novel approach with vacuum. Uh, so you'll be able to see if you go to our website, some of the videos that are out there, you actually see us sucking uh, tomatoes off the plant. Uh, and it's really wild because you're able to get a lot of efficiencies by using vacuum and you can test it afterwards and we're able to prove that we don't do any damage to the tomatoes. That's really cool. Are there other approaches that you tried out when you were kind of narrowing on that? Oh yeah, a lot. We did, uh, we probably went through all the approaches you can think of, or at least close to, and we found that vacuum is kind of the one that when you think about it, it doesn't seem like it should work because you think you'd end up with a lot of ketchup. And I can guarantee we did make a lot of ketchup in the beginning. We destroyed <laughs> so many tomatoes trying to suck them off. Uh, but once you have it really fine-tuned, it's this really efficient and effective way to be able to pick. Because you can kind of think about the difference if you're using like a, a gripper 
and you're picking tomatoes, you have to go out, you have to pick it, you have to come back, you have to place it, you have to go back out and pick it, you have to come back and place so it. So your attack pick time has gone to shit. Exactly. Versus yeah. us, we go out, we can pick, 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 come back. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, what are some of the things that you had to tune to do that? Like just throttling back diameter of the pipe. Uh, do you actively control the flow at all? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that we had to go through with iterations. Uh, a lot of it comes down to the speed of the tomato. So you have to do a lot of things to regulate the speed properly so that way you're not slamming a tomato against what could be a hard surface at, you know, hundred miles per hour. So that's kind of the big one is managing velocity. And then of course the ending kind of contact, making sure that it is something that's not as rigid as like a, a cinder block wall, but something that has a little <laughs> bit more pliability. And then on top of that, you have to make sure there's no damage. So you have to make sure throughout the whole process, there's nothing that's going to cause any damage. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work. Unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail about no, how we made it happen. No, that's all interesting but, uh, stuff that yeah, you've you, you learn a lot when you're uh, picking tomatoes in the greenhouse all summer long with vacuum. Yeah, I, I'm. I have ideas. I don't. I don't want to pick too hard because you know it sounds like you can't get super into the tech. But I don't know. Maybe privately, yeah, I'll no, ask you. <laughs> sounds <laughs> was, good. Was it this? <laughs> cool. Um, so, what made you? I guess just decide to get into robotics in the first place. I mean, it sounds like you were doing IoT stuff. So. Probably always a project guy, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. So if we go back uh, even before that now, so back into high school, uh, my senior year of high school is really interested in neuroscience. And so I was reading tons of books about the brain, everything else cutting edge back in what was that, I guess, 20, 2012. Uh, and through all this stuff with neuroscience, I always enjoyed engineering and had built up a bunch of different things when I was younger and was really enthralled with this concept of neural prosthetics. Uh, so now it's kind of like what you see must do with Neuralink. But back then you had people like Andy Schwartz at Pitt who'd actually taken a brain computer interface, uh, implanted it into a quadriplegic. And she was able to use a robotic arm to eat a chocolate bar again and to drink from a water bottle again. Oh, cool. And I thought this was a really cool field. And I actually came to Pitt thinking I wanted to get into neural prosthetics. And so my freshman year, I was all in neural prosthetics, looking at getting into a lab and then had a bit of a an ethical crisis uh, where I just realized at some point it will become disadvantageous to be just human because the neural prosthetics will be so much more capable. Like a robot arm will eventually be stronger than a human arm. You'll be able to do more things than just a human hand, which could be a ways off because the human hand is pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, it's quite um, dexterous at the moment. Yeah. But uh, I kind of realized that if I was ever to be successful in the field, you'd kind of be getting to those questions and just kind of took a step back, realized, you know, I don't know if I really want to be tackling these questions right now. I like <laughs> robotics. so I'm going to go back into robotics and just focus on on water and food. Yeah, I know the feeling. There's there's a lot of stuff I feel like as a roboticist you get asked to do where you're like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, that's mighty dicey. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, especially nowadays too with AI and you see everything with uh, with wars and weapons and. Yeah, the weapons stuff is interesting. That's one I've kind of come up against ethically in the past, and then, I mean, I have friends that work for you know large social media companies. We'll say that are pretty concerned about the ethics of that at the moment which is interesting where you know i mean i don't want to get political or anything but you know it's it's just you have a lot of power i guess when you when you get a certain amount of market share and you know what you do with it you know becomes kind of interesting uh, so. oh yeah definitely yeah. huge believer anytime you have uh, i feel like anything where you can really capture the public's attention or and really anything where you can really be the information source uh, you have a lot of power in the classic, like with, with great power comes great responsibility and yep. that can definitely be used well or it can be misused. And, uh, or sometimes the lines are blurred where like, you know, one person might think something's the appropriate use and someone else might disagree. And very true. You yeah. know, it's kind of up to the, the company to make an ethical decision as to how they feel or, you know, Yep, definitely. sometimes they don't. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes there's very uh, not clear lines as to why this decision was made, why this decision was made and they conflict and yeah, it's a, yeah, social media is a messy space. Yeah, for sure. I actually deleted my Facebook account, I want to say, like five or six years ago, and I feel like it was one of the best decisions I ever made just for mental well-being. <laughs> yeah, I have not been on Facebook. I think I, it was probably like four years ago. Nice. Like the last time I was on Facebook. Yeah, you're going to want to take that back there right after I tell you this. Until this last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious yeah i i have the uh, unfortunate or great pleasure however you want to look at it of i'm the person who has to plan the uh, high school 10-year reunion and so when get it was stuck like, with that job you know i should go back and tell high school me that hey don't be president of the class because that means you have to do the reunion in 10 years you're signing up for work uh that wait future you is not gonna want when do you get to retire as a high school president because it sounds like 
you're, you're sort of in it for life. Yeah, I thought you were done, but no, you're in charge of all the reunions. So I guess till I die, life, I am Cantino. always uh, <laughs> class of 2013 reunion planner. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, so had to yeah. reboot Facebook for that reason because got to go find all the guest lists. And yeah, get it makes everyone. a lot of sense. But uh, that's yeah. kind of why I kept it for years was just being able to get invited to things and then keep in touch with friends out of the country. But when I finally got rid of it, I remember, you know, like, I'm just like, just add me on WhatsApp. You know? Yeah, definitely. You can bet the second this is all over in like six months, it's going to be like nine years till I'm on Facebook again. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> How often are there reunions? Like just 10 years you got to plan them? I think so. I hope so. I think we had Sorry. one at the five year, but I didn't have to plan that one. So I did not. Um, but I think 10, I don't know. Is it 10 and then 20 then 30? Or is it like 10 and then 25 and then 50? I'm just speculating. I have no idea. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, I guess I should look that up. That's fair. But hopefully. Who decides, right? I mean, if anything, I think the president gets to make that decision. But yeah, yeah, I guess I guess that's true. I can say, yeah, it's the 10 and the 25 and then the 50. Yeah, do that. Just get yourself out of it. <laughs> right. if, if it's the 50, there's probably not going to be a lot of people left at that point. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, um, I went to a grad school reunion recently where I, um, I didn't think I'd, I'd really ever get into that because... I don't know. I'm I'm sort of a bit of like a lone wolf kind of douche where like if I see people joining a fraternity, I'm like, ah, I'll make my own friends. Yeah. Or if I see people like <laughs> yeah. in an organization too much. But I guess I'm active in like the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. So, you know, it's becoming less and less true. And I feel like the older I get, the more I mellow out. But I actually had a great time. Like it was really nice. And, you know, I got to see what a lot of the new MRSDs are up to. And that was really fun. Um and I don't know, I got to see a bunch of my professors and that was nice. And I got to drink with people that I was, you know, in school yeah. with. And it was, it was actually good. I would do it again. I, I didn't have to plan it. So that was nice too. Also, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that sounds nice. I imagine too, once you get to graduate school, it starts becoming a little bit like more, um, people's interests are more aligned. So it's like you, you can have like, you probably have a lot of cool people who like did similar things, did cool things afterwards and you like can talk, like talk yeah. shop. You're like, oh, you worked on the Rover, you did this. It's like, oh, that's so cool. How do you do that? And that's enjoyable. Yeah. So, I mean, we're a lot alike in that way. I, that's one of my favorite things to do is to talk shop. And yeah. I, I never envied people that are, you know, you ask someone how their day is and they're like, ah, you know, thank God it's almost over. You're like, oh my God, it must be horrible to be you. Yeah, I can't imagine that. Yeah. It's like, oh, the day's almost over. Oh man. Now, I was getting excited for Monday, right? Like, um, so we record these offset. So today's a Monday, uh, but it's really coming out of Sunday. So it's, it's Sunday. But uh, <laughs> yesterday when I was like going through my schedule, um, I was like, huh. And I was like, I'm get to do this, this, and this. I get these meetings. I started texting people like, hey, we got still on. It's like 9 p.m. on a Sunday. People are probably like, hey, we get, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to enjoy what I do, and it, it sounds like you're in the same position. So. Definitely, yeah. I, mean, I feel like it makes life so much easier. Oh, hell yeah. It's like work is not a burden, but work is fun. It's, uh, yeah. Yep. How did you, uh, did you find yourself there? Like, do you think just kind of building the relationship with Dan and, and starting the company or did you enjoy it like before then when you were just doing student activities and like previous jobs or like, I don't know. Yeah. I think I, I always enjoyed uh, like doing things and creating things and like building things. I think that's always been a trend. And I think uh, my time through Pitt, especially at university, um, I found that I did not do a lot in classes uh, I was that person who like I had good grades ended up like getting kind of top of the class but never really spent a lot of time studying I was the kid who especially by the end of university was like falling asleep in class uh, <laughs> I don't know why professors didn't hate me as much as they probably should have um, but was spent a lot of time out of class doing things and I feel like that's where I learned everything and I was very lucky uh, my freshman year uh, to be in a lab with uh, Dr. Dr. Vipperman uh, from the mechanical engineering department, which I was an EE, which doesn't make a lot of sense. That's but, all good. I used to hang yeah. out at the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Club when I was a Pitt student. Yeah. And we were doing a lot of, uh, we were working in artificial networks, like as a freshman. And I had to teach myself like the fast Fourier transform, like second semester of school when oh, it's like cool. juniors are supposed to learn that. And, uh, and that professor really they taught even learned me. learned it then. Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> uh, he really taught me about like the, uh, I guess the value of teaching yourself stuff. And he really called like the PhD is just a license to learn. 
And that's really the key. It's about teaching yourself how to learn. And so I think that's what I became really interested in uh, throughout university. So a lot of the things that I do on my own, I joined a bunch of clubs. I was very lucky to kind of build a robotics club from five people to over 60 people. By the time I graduated, was able to be president of ESC, which was like 120 people. What's ESC? uh, Sorry, Engineering Student Council. Oh, cool. Good call out. Yeah, yeah, so I, I stayed very, very busy in university, but it was almost never because of classes. It was always like something else. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like I was kind of similar. Like when I was an undergrad, I would always sketch. Uh, I would try to do like different Boolean logic problems in my notes. I would sketch truth tables and I would draw AND gates and OR gates. And oh, yeah. I'd be thinking about my RoboClub projects all the time. So I was just kind of trying to, you know, brainstorm what we needed and, you know, what kind of boards we'd be building that day and firing off emails to my teams. And yeah. I, I always was more interested in that than the stuff in class. And I was always kind of waiting for class to be over so I could go and work on other stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's so much more fun. Also, I remember when I graduated, you could actually graduate without knowing how to solder, which I, I don't think is possible anymore. Uh, they've changed the curriculum. Oh, I was trying God. to like, I was trying to make sure along with uh, Bill and Jim at the, at CERC, uh, which is, what is it? The Student Electronics Resource Center. We were really pushing like uh, people need a hands-on experience, even though you're engineers, like maybe you don't ever do it yourself. Just knowing that. Um, you technicians are going to want to murder you if you don't have that experience. <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> you did what? Do you know how to do this? This is not possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't need service length. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the wire is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, I ordered just the right amount. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, there's no extra. I mean, you don't need to strip it. Your strips yeah. are perfect all the time. Why would anybody use leaded solder? Lead free makes, I mean, it's just better for the environment. It's not going to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind that it's spiders and <laughs> all yeah. sorts of issues getting it to the right temperature. But <laughs> yeah, that was, that was one of the saddest things. Is like, yeah, lead solder is just so much nicer to work with. Oh yeah, it's like oh. Well, they still use it in like aerospace. I mean, for the most part, right? So I don't think we fly anything to space with lead-free solder in it. Yeah, at least last I checked, like you know. Yeah, I haven't looked at that, but makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, doing my very first, like, I forgot what the series was, but it was the tiny surface mount ones where you have to have the microscope to really be able to, like, get it in place. Oh, that's awesome. And that was that was a lot of fun. I I never learned how to solder under a microscope. I'm kind of jealous of you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it, it, it's kind of exactly how it sounds. If you can solder regularly, you can probably solder under a microscope as long as you can keep your hand steady. That seems like the tricky bit. Are you doing like a legged package that way or like what would you? What this would you was, do? I never did a full legged. I was just doing kind of individual components. So I was using just two pads. I oh, think cool. maybe I did a, a four pad one, um, but yeah, nothing, nothing too crazy, but it was fun to do the. I, I would do those with the naked eye, but they might've been slightly bigger. Yeah, I think you, there are definitely some of the bigger ones you can do with the naked eye. The really small series you can. You can probably get away if you have really good eyes. You might have really good eyes. I could see you having really good eyes. I, I, I was twenty twenty up until recently, and then the last couple of years, like I probably am going to need glasses within like five to ten years. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, it's sad how it deteriorates. I remember at one point, I think it was, I used to be like, I think it was like 2010 or something. Like nice. Five years ago, and I've just seen it get worse and worse and worse. And <laughs> it's like, oh no, this trend line's not good. Maybe we can get a group on on LASIK. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool though I, I had a buddy um he was also on the podcast his name is Ricardo, Ricardo Olivares and um he uh was telling me about the soldering class he took at NASA and some of the stuff they got to do oh, which was really interesting that must have been so cool so, solder under a microscope was one of the things um another one was like wetting just enough solder into like a, a joint between wires so that you didn't oversaturate it and because the weight if you're flying it oh yeah it adds up yeah it's lead right it's like one of the heaviest things so um, there's that. Um, I, I learned when I was at SpaceX as an intern um, that you don't want to butt join anything when you solder because I kind of self-taught as a kid, probably same as you. And um, you know, I started messing around with electrical stuff when I was like seven years old. And I always used to think that like well, all my projects, I would solder end to end on the wire. And so what that does, I found out later, I learned from one of the technicians at SpaceX is you're making the solder structural because it's bridging between your two bits of copper. And, you know, as a result, I mean, if you get any kind of cyclic loading, you're going to break it. And so now I always solder with them crossed by maybe like a centimeter or so. Yeah. pre tin it, just do a nice little heat, perfect amount. Exactly. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. I'm definitely by no means not even close to an expert solder. But But then if you overheat, like the solder wicks back into the wires and now it's brittle and you lose the advantage of multi-core. So yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you knew that, but for people listening. Yeah. <laughs> don't overheat your wires when you're soldering. <laughs> yeah, and you'll also melt the jacket. And it'll yeah, look oh, crappy. that's the worst. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to add more solder, so you'll waste that. It'll be heavier, and it'll be rigid like a paper clip. So. Yeah, I remember... Uh, there were times when I used to take like the stranded wires and I like twist it together like you would in like a uh, yeah we all did that at the, the beginning plugs. yeah and then you solder <laughs> and then someone tells you like how are you ever gonna take that apart if you need to it's like with the dikes yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah there's no reversible way to do that it's got to... <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I would I would do really janky things like that like I would I would do that and then I would solder over it. And then I would pull it back behind the jacket, and then I would electrical tape it to the side of the cable jacket. And then I would do another one like that, and then I would electrical tape that on top of the <laughs> other one. And then I would do another yeah. one, and then I would electrical tape that yeah. on top And of when one. you're doing it, you feel like, wow, I'm so smart. Like, this yeah, is exactly. never going to break. This like, is this never is coming genius. undone. I'm a genius. <laughs> I'm Kanye West of soldering. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, you know, you're just. Uh, yeah, then someone who knows what they're doing comes over and looks, and you're just like, oh. <laughs> Let me let me learn you a thing or two, Sonny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes a lot of sense. What are some of the other projects you worked on when you were growing up and kind of getting into it? Yeah, so growing up, the the weirdest thing, the thing that I wish I had more experience with with was I never actually learned how to code until freshman year of college. Late bloomer. Uh, yeah, very, <laughs> very late in that regard. And then when I started coding, I, th I thought this was amazing. But growing up, it was a whole bunch of just um, like smaller mechanical projects. So it was a lot of just like contraptions and machines that were all, I don't want to say dumb, but like had no intelligence. Oh, yeah. And I'd just be like, move around and like try to shoot this or like accomplish this task. And so it was all very just, what was it, like programmatically simple. Because uh, uh, it's the tools you got. Do you ever do the beam robotics thing? No, it, it is like an acronym that stood for biological, aesthetical, economical, and mechanical. It was is kind of, I would say dumb because it's like the first robot I ever built was like that. But all it was was um, it was like two AA batteries, and then you had them in series, and then you put like a tap between the two, and then if you connected a motor between battery one and its output terminal, you could. Um, reverse it if you switched that uh to battery two's output terminal because oh. you would reverse the polarity by going through a different battery so it's probably horrible for the batteries you're draining them unevenly but you could make simple circuits that you know like you would connect uh like a micro lever switch between you know where you'd have the common connected to the common and then you'd have one connected to um you know one side of the battery one connected to the other and you could have the thing automatically reverse when like a whisker hit off something without any real oh, you know electronics cool. or intelligent yeah it was neat so there's there's stuff like that i made a tutorial called the world's most simple robot where i did that and it's like the most viral thing i've ever put on the internet which is kind of embarrassing but, <laughs> that's yeah. how it works though simple is better right? yeah yeah and people like accessible stuff i found so you know i, I feel like some of the content i'm putting out now is like not nearly uh it's maybe not accessible enough, like, you know, for, oh, a, for yeah. a mass audience, but I don't know. Yeah, that makes it. sense. I remember uh, growing up in, I think it was, yeah, I think it was early high school. For some reason, my, my uncle actually lives in Pittsburgh, so I grew up in Denver. Um, oh, cool. But we were here in Pittsburgh to see my uncle, and somehow my brother and I just got inspired. Like, we really just wanted to build our own shed and, like, have our own little hangout. And so my mom decided that, hey, if you want to build a shed, you got to do it right. So we had to like create all the sketches, make all the drawings. We had to do all like the two by fours, all the framing. She's like, in, in the backyard, you got to put it on concrete pillars. So you had to like do the concrete and get that in there, build the whole like foundation, well, foundation, so like four pillars and then plywood <laughs> across with two by fours. And then we did the, the windows. She actually hired a one of our friends, her friends was a contractor and so she hired him for a little bit to teach us like how to put windows oh that's stuff, cool which is kind of neat and i remember like putting yeah, you'll always have that. windows doing the siding putting the shingles on top and it was just yeah it was a, a big summer project that came from just like hey it'd be cool Wait, how old were you when you did that uh, i think i was probably well to ask my mom i don't fully remember <laughs> but i want to say like 13 i didn't do that when i was <laughs> yeah. 13 that's awesome yeah no nail guns were allowed at that point though it was all just all hammers didn't want you driving a nail through your hand. Yeah. Safety first. And parents, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool, though. Like, that's the coolest thing I ever made. I, I used to do woodworking, too. was like a house for my neighbor's cat. The cat never went inside of. But it was a pretty sweet house, right? Well. It looked cool. Not as cool as what you're describing. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> I remember, and I think it was like middle school, our mom sent us to camp. Maybe it was elementary school, and they had like the bird houses, like the robin bird houses, uh, which is like super simple open bird houses. My brother and I made it. We're so excited. And of course, no bird ever went in that bird house. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> you see it there every day. You're like, oh, is there a good bird? Nope. Next season, bird? Nope. Yeah. It's like classic engineering hubris, right? Where you just design something fun to build, but you don't think about the end user at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if I build it, they'll come. Yeah, yeah it's of exactly course. what they need. Yeah. <laughs> Although, like, I mean, there must be design tricks to making a birdhouse that's like habitable to birds. Like, there must be. I think so. I think this camp like downloaded off the internet, if the internet was true, uh, this like design that was made specifically for robins. It's more open. It's not like the single hole like you see for some of the smaller birds. They actually like it where it's kind of like a roof and it's kind of open here. It's a, a little lip. So it's very accessible. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why. We had robins in our yard. They just didn't like it. Maybe we made it too open. Maybe the paint didn't smell good. Maybe we had like human fingerprints over it. I'm not sure what it was. but That's interesting. Well, sometimes, yeah, yeah you just, yeah, it doesn't always go the way you planned. Yeah. Should have done more customer discovery. Should have <laughs> talked to those robins. <laughs> Or put, <laughs> <laughs> or put some worms in there at least try to bait them to come yeah, in yeah just bribe them <laughs> yeah timeshare presentation free golf clubs yeah yeah <laughs> d- exactly give them some marketing a, a discount hey it's free for the first week or yeah. better we'll pay you worms for the first week and then uh <laughs> puppy dog clothes yeah. take it home <laughs> see if you like it just move in you know <laughs> exactly come on please i built this for you <laughs> that's awesome yeah, what were uh, what were some of the projects you worked on outside the the whisker, the whisker yeah. robot? Uh, so, I guess probably the first thing I ever did when I was like seven years old was just light up a light bulb. Like I was like really excited to just walk down the street to Radio Shack and take you know my parents' money, <laughs> buy a light bulb and a battery and hook that up. Um, I guess. I don't know. I, I made this kind of novel uh, thing that could like light up segments on a um, numeric uh, LED display. So it used um, the little things you use when you're, um, you know, those little brass things that you put like in the corner to hold papers together. And it's like a little nub, like a button. And then you fold two things out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so I, it's I, usually kind of like black and silver or something. Like yeah, you, exactly. You squeeze in and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I took those and I put, like, I had, like, a cathode. And then I had, like, rows for each of the segments and the LED display. And then I sort of truth tabled it out on pencil and paper. And I put, um, you know, I like numbers one through one through nine to zero. And then I, um, you'd have to, like, push down the whole thing. Like, it was, like, foam board but you could get him to light up the number you press. So I was really proud of that when oh, I was a kid. I yeah, see, when you were seven. Well, maybe like eight or nice. nine at that point. Like I, I progressed slightly, <laughs> but still didn't know about transistors or you know TTL or microcontrollers or anything like that. Um, one of the things I made, like my first robot that didn't wasn't a beam robot, used a basic stat microcontroller. I would have been like twelve or thirteen at the time. I think I was thirteen, and it used a basic stamp and it had a little pan tilt unit and it had a camera and then it was a CMU cam too, I think. Yeah. And then if you remember that, and then it was like this camera from Ilya Norbach's lab where it had some intelligence so it could track like a center of mass on um, like a red ball or something against oh, nice. contrasting yeah. backgrounds. Red ball sounds like a tomato. If yeah. only it was that simple for yeah, us. Well, <laughs> I wish. It's by Alien or Box products. Yeah. Where's this? I need to look it up. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know, like, things like that. Um, I uh, I got into like homemade fireworks when I moved to a rural area as a kid. Um, actually, here, here's a good story. So uh, one day for the one year for the Fourth of July, um, we decided to make our own fireworks, and Ooh. we thought we're going to make the the big one, like the firework to end all fireworks. So. We took an SD's model rocket and we um, got, it was like cardboard and we mounted the model rocket in the cardboard. And then um, it was like me and like my brother and my uncle. And um, we filled it up with gunpowder. <laughs> but I think I had gotten like some potassium permanganate from my high school chemistry teacher, which burns purple. Oh, nice. So I mixed the potassium permanganate with the gunpowder. So it'd have like a big purple fireball. And then I took apart like a bottle rocket that, you know, at the time I think we bought it illegally in a different state. And I put fuses on the little bits from the bottle. I dissected it and there were these little like teeny um, bits that would, you know, 
glow blue and then explode. So Ooh. I put those around the outside of the, the rocket and ran the fuses in so that the gunpowder would ignite and then they would fly out and then you'd see this star pattern. And it's really meticulous with yeah, it. Say, this sounds very well planned, very well thought out. Yeah, because my, my thinking was like the fuses will ignite from the gunpowder then the explosion will propel these things out in like you know a square pattern or something like it, and then the like the blue charge will ignite. You know that usually it's like a glowing bark, and then they'll explode. You know when they get so far away, so you should see them ignite like a distance out. And then, but anyway, we did all this stuff. We put fins on it, and we just had this vicious dog at the time, <laughs> and the dog sees it and is like, ah, oh, stick! Oh, oh no! And like she bites one of the fins off and. So, you know, I was so excited to launch this thing. I, I just didn't really think clearly, and I duct taped the fin back on, not really realizing that, this you know. This will do. I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's not going <laughs> to melt or anything, you know. I'll do <laughs> rocket propulsion. And so, um, you know, you know, we went in the park. There was, like, a park near our house uh, that had a really good view of the city. We sort of arced it at a 45 so it would go over the city and explode and lit it. And it just corkscrewed after me and my brother and my uncle. And we had to run away from this thing and duck, like, behind a rock. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it was terrifying. Did it go off? Nice it did. And purple? Yeah, it exploded right over our just heads. Just right in front of you? Yeah. yeah. And you're like, oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, at least that part of the plane worked. It yeah, was yeah. a beautiful purple. I, 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 never got, I never got to see if the if the little teeny ones went off afterward because I was too busy, you yeah, know, crapping ducking. my pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was that, that was that really loud too? If it was that close to you? Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just I think I was kind of like covered. Yeah, <laughs> half of you was blocking it out because it was traumatic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did so. you ever make another one? Um, I don't think so. After that, <laughs> I, I might have. I I'm, I can't remember to be honest. So maybe uh, next summer. We'll have a, a new Spencer firework going on. Ah, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to do that, Brandon, I'll I'll do the project with you. All right, <laughs> let's see. Yeah. yeah, I feel like you know it's it's weird because it was easier to do that living in a rural area. I was in upstate New York at the time, and um, you know, it was just it was basically like a farm. I, I lived in a town called Ithaca. Oh um, uh, yeah, yep. It was uh, it was like a sixty thousand population and ten square miles, but I mean Pittsburgh's urban. You can't you can't get away with that stuff here. No, yeah, definitely you have to go out of the city for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can't just go up to uh, let's see what's a, a park nearby here, like the park on the south side. Yeah, you get slow. arrested. Just go there and try to launch. Yeah, that would. <laughs> yeah, also be very scared of hurting anyone doing that. Well, exactly. Like, go far out, like yeah, what would be like Maroon State Park? Is that Maroon State Park would probably be fine. I actually tested a. Um, did they ever tell you about that underwater data collection system? Like it was like one of SKA's first projects. I don't know if you did. So it was um, it was like a Pelican case that we modified and had a bunch of sensors mounted externally and some weights on it, and we had this winch mechanism that would unlock a clutch and lower this thing down, you know, with an encoder like a certain number of meters, and then it would take measurements the whole time of dissolved oxygen, salinity, temperature and um, depth by way of pressure. And um, we had a real-time clock in there and a data logger, and then you'd corroborate the data that it captured to GPS data at the surface, and you could make like a 3D map of all those variables in a lake. Oh, nice. So it was pretty fun. So we tested that at Marin State Park, is what I thought of that. It's the only time I've been there. Rented rented a boat for like 130 bucks on the cheap. And nice. Dangled that thing out the back and took a bunch of test readings. Cool. So it was a motorized boat. You weren't like uh, with oars. Yeah, it was a motor like boat. <laughs> <laughs> Just 130 bucks for like two hours, though. That's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I guess I don't know what boat rates are. It I have seems no idea like what... that doesn't seem too I feel bad. like it's cheap. Like, but yeah, I, it seems like it. It probably wasn't an expensive boat to begin with, but. Yeah, was it just like a. Outboard motor. My grandpa has like. It's, the boat is literally just like almost like sheet metal. It was bit, like, like that, thick yeah. sheet metal. And he just has like a little electric motor for some lakes because they don't let motors go. And then he's got his gas motor. But it's, yeah, it's a, it's a cheap boat. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of cool, though, that he's got the electric motor, too. This was just a gas motor. so Yeah, it's funny. You have the gas motor. It's like this big. And you have the electric motor. And it's like. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Why not just go electric, I wonder, and have a generator for extended range? Like, yeah. There must be a reason why they don't do that. Like. I know at least in his case, the reason he didn't do it is because the electric motor was like 
you were not going fast at all. It was like a oh, trolling motor, and it was like that's what was allowed in that lake. Like you couldn't go fast. So he's like, all right, this gets me to the max speed I can go. Uh, <laughs> but if you're like out in a bigger lake, you don't want that motor because it's taking you forever. Well, to I feel like with like a giant electric motor, the downside would just be that it would draw so much current. You your generator wouldn't be able to keep up unless you had a massive generator. Yeah. Uh, hypothetically, I could be wrong on this. And I guess yeah, I think in that one. So you also you'd have all that battery weight, except you're yeah. saying just generates to take out the batteries. Well, you might then, still want like a battery as a buffer, but you wouldn't need a ton of them, like you said. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, I guess the electric motor is simpler. You just have that instant torque. I guess yeah. do they really have any gearing in? I don't think like I mean boat. the Tesla doesn't have gearing. I don't know what they do in boats, but yeah, because like if the if like a gas boat motor, what would be the benefit of an electric boat motor over a gas one? If you have to have, I gas would think for it would be generator. quiet when you wanted it to be. Like you could uh, you could switch off the generator if your neighbors are mad, and you could you know throttle down the electric just by way of you know signals to the drive. Gotcha. Yep. And then yeah, you could you could sense. let it rip when you get out in the water, yeah. uh, and you know it would all be one motor. You wouldn't have to dangle a second motor, but yep. I'm sure it would probably be more complex electrically and cost more. Yeah, but it'd be cooler. It would be cooler. <laughs> you need a bigger electric motor. Um, you'd have better low end torque. I don't know. Yeah, I think. Uh, when are you getting this boat, Spencer? Are uh, you gonna are you gonna put this on your boat? <laughs> I am not gonna buy a boat. Uh, maybe eventually. It could go perfect though. You could take the boat with the fireworks, middle of the Lake of Marone, launch it there. And then it would be so easy to find me when the <laughs> <laughs> state troopers show up or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I guess our, our launching fireworks, it's illegal in Pennsylvania, right? I think they might have just made them legal recently. I, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, I loved fireworks as a kid, and I always, like, you know, I'd make those fireworks, and it was one of my favorite things. But then recently, um, I want to say they got made legal in Pennsylvania. I could be wrong on this. Um, and if I am, then the story is made up. But I recently bought a bunch of fireworks from um, Ohio over the border. And, I mean, we definitely were under the impression it was legal when we did this. And, um, you know, we, uh, me and, and the cousin, you know, we're just lighting them off. And the cops showed up. And we're like, well, I thought, we were, I thought it was legal. <laughs> I guess the neighbors complained. And um, I don't know, it just wasn't nearly as fun as it was before. You know, like, it's just... I think you kind of you kind of grow out of it a little bit. Gotcha. Like yeah, that, if that makes sense. I've never uh, launched a firework in my life. Closest I've come is sparklers. That's right. I mean, did pretty, you ever live in like a rural area? Not really. No, I just grew uh, up in like suburbia in so Colorado. I grew up in Squirrel Hill uh, when I was a kid, up until I was thirteen, which is a pretty. I wouldn't say urban, but it's maybe suburban. I don't know what you'd call Squirrel Hill, like. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's kind of like, like urban, urban, light. suburb. Yeah, yeah, it's it's probably more on the urban side than the suburban side. Yeah, but my point is, we never messed around with fireworks when I was growing yeah. up there. And then when I moved to Ithaca, you know, that's when I started messing around with that stuff because it was just more hip in a remote yeah. area, and there was less culture and things to do. Yeah, um, you know, not that Ithaca is not cultural, but it just you know it was a smaller area, and you know there's less going on. And then, you know, living in a city again, I just am not that interested in it. So yeah. uh, I think now you're building robots. Yeah, yeah. robots are way more you got fun. A, you got a lot more cool things to work on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't, well, when they're done right, they don't have that same boom. <laughs> in, in, in I don't know. I used to do battle bots, right? Which That's true. Yeah. like that. Uh, did you ever get into that? No, I, I almost did. And then I, I kind of pulled back. Um, Why'd you pull back? I think for me, it was just, uh, they look expensive. And I just didn't have a lot of money to it's really a build like a, a high quality, <laughs> high quality battle bot. Um, yeah, that's a fact. I um, I built a thirty pound one in grad school that I think I probably spent like two thousand dollars on. So, for a grad student, that's a lot of money. And um, yeah. yeah, that's uh, definitely, but a lot of time too, like hundreds of machining hours and yeah. you know, solid works hours and calling out favors from other people to help with the welding because I'm not a good welder and. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I never became a good driver on it because I was always just tinkering and, and trying to figure out how to to build the thing. So I don't know. I did that for a while, and then work just kind of picked up. And I, I, you know, it's hard to justify the time outlay. Like it was, it was yeah. just time expensive. Yep. So I pulled back. That makes sense. I actually, gave it away uh, to to a kid that I hoped would just use it and oh. have fun with it. Do you know if he did? 
Is he competing uh, with it? He did not. I was actually upset when I found out. Oh. <laughs> Can I have it back? I'm going to give it to someone else. Yeah, it's donate it to the Senior Box yeah. Club. You know? <laughs> yeah, they'll make use of it. Yeah, because I think you showed me it a while ago, and you had like the, it was had like this big spinning piece of metal, right? Yeah, like it was, yeah. It would have been, uh, I think, a vertical spinner, and then it had a cam mechanism to pull that up and release it. Did your did your spinner? I can't remember. Was it perfectly rectangular? Or did you have kind of a point on one end? Uh, it was a well. I started with symmetric, so I had a rectangular bar made out of it was S seven or four one thirty. I think a buddy of mine who got me into the the sport uh, named Luke Yant. You, I don't know if you know him or not. No, I don't think so. But he he got me into it. Um, he's a mechanical engineer at Daedalus now, oh, and nice. uh, yeah, good dude. I, I like him a lot. Um, he gave me a bar from one of his battle bots that he named Hello Kitty Friendship Surprise. <laughs> And it was six pounds of steel, and you know I built my my battle bot out of that, and so I just changed the orientation and added fifteen more pounds of robot and expense and controllers and stuff, and um, yeah, eventually I kind of kept optimizing and I was sort of addicted, and so I um, built an asymmetric spinner which reduced some of the weight, um, and then I put the weight into armor in different places, but. So much time. Yeah. <laughs> never get back. <laughs> Lots of machining. But yeah. it was worth it. A lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. And that's learned. how you get better as an engineer is, is those fun projects. So. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think for me, I remember uh, my first time doing stuff with like uh, RF was I was living in the, probably shouldn't say it, in some apartments in Oakland. <laughs> and they had like a garage underneath and i i had a bike but i didn't have a car and i got really annoyed because i didn't have uh an easy access to garage code i had had a friend who did um but i was like this is so annoying to try to get it from my friend and to carry this around and i was like you know what i bet i could probably spoof this and so i took an arduino i bought uh the frequency like a transmitter and receiver for the frequencies of the garage door i bought my first like a sdr uh antenna sdr uh Oh, I can't remember what it's software defined radio. Yes, thank you. Okay. And uh, was able to read the signal, realized that it actually didn't have a rolling code. It just sent the same code over and over. Oh, again. that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then so I was like, oh well, this is too easy. And then I just uh, coded that up in the Arduino, put it on the transmitter, so it would transmit that code. Added in a, a Wi-Fi capability, so I could text it. That go to web page or no? Oh, that's did cool. Web page or did I text? I don't remember what I ended up doing. One of the two were. <laughs> be I hilarious. Think it was text. just a totally unpassable protected web page. <laughs> yeah. How did I do it? Brandonsgarage.com. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. That's ah, not there anymore. Yeah. You can go <laughs> visit it. <laughs> I think what I did, the reason I'm confused, I think I got a <laughs> SIM card, but it just had data. So I think it technically was just, yeah, through internet. But yeah, That's and awesome. then you, I would bike, just send a message to it or like log on to the page, open it up, it broadcasts, it could go in, go out. That's really cool. When I was a freshman in college, I, I sort of did a similar one. So what before I add, before I tell that story, how did you know what frequency uh, range to, to go after for the SDR or like the... Yeah, the, how did I do that? I think I did a couple things with RF. I don't remember if this was the one where I looked at the the remote and i went to the fcc documentation oh nice and just found it it's a pro i move. did that for a couple other things i don't think that was this one though this one may have just most been... people would not be able to figure that out as a student like i feel like yeah. you brute force everything in those days or at least i did i was shocked at how much information's on the fcc website web page about like what it does and how it operates i think i think you actually can find the documentation for the codes that it sends on the FCC. I remember, I think it was there. It was somewhere I actually saw the code written out. Like, I didn't even have to do the SDR. Like, after I'd already done the SDR at one point, I found the code. I was like, oh, wow. Really? <laughs> it's wild. But, yeah. So I, I tried to make a, uh, a smart lock when I was a freshman. I think it would have been in 2008 or 2007. Uh, I was at Case Western, and our design kind of sucked. Like, we took a hobby servo, and you know that thing you can do where you strip the potentiometer out of it and you make it spin continuous so so we modified it like that and then it was set up so that it used like some kind of h bridge and then sent a signal to you know the wires from the servo and then there was a bracket so i machined a part which was just looked like a flathead screwdriver and um it would mate to the lock on the dorm room doors and so what i did is i took the lock apart 
I inserted this thing in after I reverse engineered it, and then I just bolted it to the to the door nice. in my freshman dorm <laughs> from the inside. And I um, I was able to actuate it by sending power one direction or the other to the motor, uh, which I thought I was pretty damn clever. And then I put it, I guess, in a position where the key wouldn't work because it was like just in a place uh, where yeah. there was like some kind of like leverage you just couldn't get. And so I locked myself out in a way that was super embarrassing because I, I, I think that the hardware failed from the inside and I was locked out. And I had to call the campus police. <laughs> they showed up and they sent a maintenance guy. He came with a monkey wrench, or I guess it was a pipe wrench. And he must have marred up the, the lock pretty bad, but he just twisted it off the door. <laughs> that was the end of that startup. <laughs> so, Did you get in any trouble for, uh, for adapting the lock? To be honest, I, I don't think they got us in trouble. I mean, I, we paid good tuition, so I think it was just like, yeah. I yeah, remember, I got so, uh, yeah. Enamored with just like everything. Oh, how can you get past this? How can you get past that? Like yeah. everything was just a, a puzzle. Like you just wanted to see if you could do it just to do it. Yeah, same. So I, I remember my parents had these alarm systems uh, in, in the houses I grew up in. And we would always try to figure out, or I would always try to figure out, I said we then, I would always try to figure out how to get through them or how to defeat them. So there were those um, PIR sensors they had for motion. Um, mm -hmm. they probably are still in use, but kind of a, a rudimentary sensor. I don't even know exactly how it works. It's got like something that looks like a prism. I, I actually have no idea how these things yeah, work. I've I don't either. Into it. I just see it. But I found if you could move really, really slowly, like it wouldn't pick you up. So that was an interesting one. And then um, there were like tamper switches on the doors. So I found if you jammed a butter knife, like right where that switch was, you could pry it open, like between that and the door frame. Ooh. So I, I would just do it for fun. I mean, you know, it's like, breaking and exiting <laughs> yeah your own house. house yeah i did that so many times on my apartment too yeah. i was just like oh let's see can i get in this way I was like yep all right that's not very secure can i get in this way yep all right that's not very secure <laughs> exactly it's like the like the lock picking lawyer videos on youtube where it's like yeah. don't pick someone else's lock but yeah. if it's yours you know, yeah. it's, it's just learning do it yeah again. exactly it's just educational i remember learning uh like how some doors have, you know how they have that, uh, I don't know what to call it, but the, you know when you pull the handle down, it's got like the plug that comes in and then it goes out and that's what actually holds the door closed. I forgot what you actually call that piece. But it's kind of like curved like this. And it's like the flat edge and the curved edge. I'm trying to, to think. So I, I, I'm having trouble picturing it for some reason. No worries. Yeah, so like doors here, handles here, and it kind of sticks out here. And then here's like your door frame. Oh, and it's that latch where it closes when you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and how I always thought it was wild. I I saw a door, and I, I never was like it, instead of a flat piece, it had like a little bulge here, like a second piece. Oh, and I was just very curious what it was for. And I was just playing around, and I realized that if you push this flat, this like bulge piece in first, it locks the lock, so you can't push this. Yeah. So it was a way so someone couldn't like jimmy like the credit card. In. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's no, kind of yeah. It's kind of clever, clever, easy solution. Yeah, well, and, and obviously the person who designed that, you know, picked a lock at one point, and that's how they <laughs> learned, you know, like, yeah. oh, there's a need here, you know, I could create a more secure lock, you know, and that's how you end up with better security. Like, it's it's all an arms race, and you yeah. only really develop that intuition by pushing the limits of what's feasible, I think. Yeah, I think I remember it was uh, my junior year, I met a, a lock picking expert who, like, wrote a whole book about how he picked the unpickable lock. And he was, like, telling me how it was done. And it's the stories he has of, like, the things he does to, like, just prove that, hey, this isn't as secure as you thought is uh, it's pretty cool. When you say the unpickable lock, are you talking about, like, a Medico M3? It was a Medico. I don't remember which one it was, but it was the one that they were saying, like, it's unpickable. Uh, it was definitely a Medico. It was, I think, maybe three or four years ago. And then... Is that the one with the little the pins that you have to get at an angle in order to be... Yeah, yeah. yep, yep. He, he did it in seven seconds. Seven seconds? Yeah. Because he ended up doing, I forgot what it was. It was like a combination of picking and bumping. That's um, interesting. Yeah. So his first time he didn't get it in seven seconds. But like once you get it down, you I mean, can that, get it in seven seconds. I'm sure that person is really, really dexterous with those picks. I mean, like I uh, would never be able to do that. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, never need a certain skill, skill level. Probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, the people that are really into it. Like I, I never got good with the bump picks. I always use the feeler picks. And, yeah. yeah. And then I kind of just fell out of the hobby maybe like, you know, uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was yeah, fun in undergrad, fun in fun in high school. Same. You haven't done any practicing in a long time. Yeah. Who has time anymore? I I think like 
when you're when you're running a robotics company, I mean, you know, you're just you know barely have enough time to sleep with the fun stuff you get to do at work and so yeah definitely there's not that same <laughs> desire of like you get enough problems during the day it's not like oh i need to go find more problems yeah exactly it's like never-ending problems you're like yep. oh this is a cool puzzle this is a cool puzzle oh like i solved this but i could do it even better if i do it this way and then yeah it's fun it's never-ending yeah for sure <laughs> i remember I, I worked it at spacex as an intern like right out of pit before i went to carnegie mellon and um as Graduated in 2013, did the summer internship, and then went to grad school. Um, but my brother, the whole time I was doing that internship, was I, I was an IT systems intern, so I like worked on their data center. And um, my brother was like, "Hey, did you figure out about like modding your Android phone?" And I'm like, "That is the last thing <laughs> I want to do with my you know non copious free time is." is now go and, and work on another puzzle that's directly similar to the things I work on at work. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you probably know it well too, but there's always the technical problems. And then if you don't have enough technical problems, there's always the business problems. Like oh, there's yeah. always a, and you can go back and forth between the two if you want to and break And they're fun, them. but your appetite is satiated. I think when you're, yep. you know, you're yeah. pushing your limit to be able to keep up at work. Yep. Yeah, you code Even a lot. Not enough yeah. hours in the day. Yeah, then you're like, all right, spreadsheets a lot. Back to coding. Back to spreadsheets. Presentations. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Sales has been a big one for me lately. Is trying to get good at that. So, that like, have you have you like studied sales? I'm sure you have. I mean, yeah, I'd say I'm definitely not not an expert, but I've uh, every business reading. owner is an expert on sales. <laughs> <laughs> been trying to probably being modest. <laughs> been trying to read different books. It's a it's always like that grass is greener situation because in our industry, it's almost like more enterprise level sales. Uh, so it's like that really still sales. kind of long, you can't really iterate and test as many things as easily because you only have a limited amount of customers. Uh, and so it's always kind of like, how do I test this and iterate it without doing something that's <clears throat> irreversible? Yeah. Versus if you're like doing B2C or like small B2B, it's like, all right, there's like a hundred thousand millions of people that you can talk to. So like, I'll try this with this person. All right. No, it's that person. No, it's that person. Okay. So this is what's working. That's interesting. So how do you get around that? Like, do you just role play a lot more? Do you, do you strategize a lot more? Um, what's, how do you contend with that issue? Yeah. So I think this is probably true of any sale, not even just enterprise, but I think for me, it turns into, I, I have to listen a lot more. Um, and so you really just have to ask a lot more questions and really just try to understand your customer to a whole nother level. Smart. And then it's also with that listening, it's um, trying to talk to multiple people. It, it kind of at your customer because everybody in these uh, kind of sales has different incentives. It's usually not one person will just be the one who's like, I'm going to use it. I'm going to buy it. And so like, it's just me. Usually you have to talk to multiple different people to, to really make sure that we're successful. And so with each of those people really just asking lots of questions, listening, uh, and then you kind of do the same thing with multiple different people and you start to see certain trends. Um, but the hardest thing I think for us is when it comes down to thinking about pricing, because it's really easy to iterate on pricing when you have a lot of people, when you can just be like, okay, throw this at the wall, throw that, that at the wall. Whereas for us, it's like there's certain financial targets we have to hit for ourselves to be successful. But then there's also things where it's like we could be faster, do more if we could be at this price. But like, is that a realistic price? Um, so it's, yeah, I definitely know the feeling, <laughs> you know, where you're trying to figure out like what makes sense for the market. And... Yeah. But it's a fun experience. But yeah, it's really usually just all listening and really understanding that I'm a big believer at the end of the day, if you're building something that's necessary and what people want, uh, it's not a problem. Like it's sellable. Yeah. It's easy to sell that. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's kind of bad, but I, I mean, when you have a certain amount of success too, I think that track record helps you a lot. And so it's, it's much easier to get a sale when you've got good referrals and, you know, just you know, people love your product already. So that definitely that yeah. helps a lot. And I mean, I know at least in, in my case with SKA, it took a lot to kind of work up to that of, you know, just having to prove ourselves over and over and over again. And, you know, we've been lucky enough to have happy repeat customers and that helps a, helps a great deal. But I think what you said is still true. Like, you know, there's really nothing better than, than listening. I was talking to a prospective customer today and um, I mean, the conversation did not go the way I was expecting it to. And, but it, it still went well, but I just had to shut up and, and listen and kind of go off the agenda. And, 
you know that was that was what needed to be done <laughs> to, to get anywhere yeah yeah i think it's it's um someone described it to me once you almost had to like reframe what most people think about sales like when people think about sales they'll think like don draper like this really like just smooth very slick kind of like manipulative like can get everything done exactly as they were planning and they had a different approach of like it's actually almost more like you're you're trying to like hack a system in a non-nefarious way like it's a very complex thing everybody has the own things that they need everyone has their own focuses and you're trying to understand okay how does the system work and then what is the value that you really provide to that system that really helps each of these different people yeah and it's kind of like solving that puzzle and really delivering and driving and providing value yeah um, I mean, Zig Ziglar talks about that, right? Which is like, you know, sitting on the same side of the table as your customer. I think it's either Ziglar or it's the art of client service. Uh, I might I might be getting confused as to yeah, where, not, I, where I heard that. But like, I try to do that, you know, like if I'm, if I'm at a meeting, I try to sit next to, you know, like the person that, you know, we're trying to sell to. Or, I mean, just understand their culture, you know, figure out what they need and then try to actually bring it to them. Because at the end of the day, I mean, that's what everyone, like, if somebody's selling to me, you know, I, I want them to yeah. solve my problems and, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a win-win, right? Cause I mean, I'm in the market. You know, so, yep. Yeah, and I think to your part yeah. too, uh, when you were talking about like brand and referrals, um, yeah, it's a huge part of me. It makes a lot of, it helps a lot to like really do things well. And I think sometimes people over optimize for the short term and they'll burn customers. Well, that's like the Don Draper deliver. thing you're talking yeah. about, I think, right. Or it's, yeah. it's Machiavellian or it's myopic. Um, yeah. and, and unfortunately, I think you see that not to pick on certain industries, but I, I think you see it a lot with like car salesmen. Um, and then you see it a lot with the real estate or I've seen it a lot and trying to buy a house or a car, you know, where you just yeah. get, I don't want to say swindled, but you know, it kind of, it's, it's a short sighted game. Like I was looking for an investment property a few years ago and I remember, um, this woman asked what my price range was and I told her and she was like the worst kind of salesman. Like she was just like serving me properties at the top end of the range. I told her that I wanted it as an investment property and she was trying to sell an emotion, like look at this place. Mm. And I'm like, but you know, what's the market like for rentals? Like, you know, yeah. she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, is it nurses? Is it students? Is it, you know, who, who's renting in this area? I don't know. I'm like, God. That's all I want. Yeah. I had one question, you know. You don't understand what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. None of them made financial sense, you know. Like it just, it just wasn't, wasn't a good fit. And then I recently tried to buy a car, um, and um, you know, I, I found that you know so many people like were just trying to sell. Like I bought used, and so I was looking at, you know, and I found one I really like. I'm, I'm quite happy with, but. Before I found this one, you know, so many people tried to pass off like a crappy car, you know, I'm uh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. And I sent inspection mechanics to every single place. And so, you know, I found out about the issues and yeah. it's like, what are you trying to pull here? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Just be honest, you know, and, and knock some money off and we'll work on this together. And, you know, yeah, maybe it's got a bad muffler. Well, maybe we can replace that and negotiate it, you know, or, you know. Like I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get a deal here. Like, you know, like let's definitely, yeah. You know, we can we can find common ground. You know, so I ended up finding this awesome guy in Arkansas who sold me the car I bought. Uh, I know it's a bit of a schlep to buy a used car, but no, no, oh, it's a nice car. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. But the guy's name is Clint, and um, he was great. He threw in a, a jar of moonshine with the car. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully, I don't get him in trouble for saying that. Uh, but. He, he was awesome. Um, I wanted to get the car inspected. He was like, yeah, no problem. You know, and he had the technicians of this dealership, like, take it to the inspection mechanic. And then I had a second mechanic look at it, and he never had any issues with that stuff, you know. He was never trying to hide anything. Nice. Um, and then he was, like, working late, you know, like, on Fridays. And, you know, he, he would text me, like, during the weekend and at night, you know, just to kind of help push it forward. And so I just jumped on a plane. And, you know, I was like, I trust this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I bought it, and I, you know been totally happy with the purchase nice yeah yeah you, you do bring up a a good point on like different industries sometimes have different uh different approaches because it, it also depends on the business model like you're probably not going to get a repeat customer on a used car it's yeah like, oh we're just gonna like well, try to shaft spencer and get as much as i can it's funny you say yeah. that because clint texted me after i bought the car and he said i make my money on repeat business is there uh -huh. anything else i can do for you that makes sense then why he acts that way yeah you can see like once you see like the model the incentives you see it in the behavior i think one thing that our industry like the robotics industry 
uh, probably struggles with a little bit is I feel like we're a very good industry at over promising and under delivering. Ah, brutal. I think that's like, I see that a lot in robotics companies. Yeah, I've, I've definitely lost sales to uh, competitors that have done that before, and it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm trying to, yeah. I'm trying to be ethical here. You know? I'm trying to be honest, trying to tell you like what it's actually going to be and be real. I think in that regard, that's where we've been different. Uh, so we've, we've been pretty semi-stealth over the last, I don't know how many, four years, uh, because we didn't want to really make a lot of noise. Because if we make noise, you want to like put your best foot forward and all that. Uh, and like we wanted to be direct and honest. And so we didn't want yeah. to like say, hey, like we're just starting out. And like, hey, like here's the speed it's running at. But now that we're actually getting to more of that commercial status, we're okay, now we're going to start putting more out there, showing the system in action. Smart. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully it works out. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be good. I um, I had a buddy in the field robotics center that said something I really liked. Um, you know, and, and I was asking him what projects he was working on, and, and he showed me some stuff. But he's like, I don't really like to show this stuff to people because every time you tell someone about the project you haven't finished yet, you're reducing some of that dopamine rush you get when you yeah. finish it, and you're you're letting a little bit of that out. And so I, I kind of thought about that and. I, I started talking about my work less, like my active work less. Like I'll still talk about past work, you know, with a lot of pride, but I try not to talk too much about active projects or projects I'm trying to win that I haven't won yet because I feel like when you do that, you reduce your incentive to do a really good job. And also you set an expectation that, you know, it's, it becomes difficult to hit because, I mean, naturally, you know, you want to, you know, put your best foot forward and say all the good stuff and, when you do that, I mean, there is a tendency, like you said, to overpromise, and you know, you're sort of setting yourself up. I don't want to say for failure, but for a reduced probability of success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I think with that too, it's like every time you say it, a lot of times people like congratulate you, like you, you just like, um, I did some awesome projects. Be like, oh, Spencer, that's so cool, way to go. And then just like, yeah, but it didn't actually do it yet but you got all yeah. the like affirmation and all the like dopamine hit yeah exactly and then when you get there you just i would say you feel empty but you've got less at the end of the tunnel to look forward to yeah 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 one thing i i think i've started doing more in my career is trying not to crack the champagne you know as you know figuratively um where i mean even with you know like a successful successful project completion you know you're just like well still plenty of time for things to go wrong <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah dan and i were on the opposite side we uh we're really bad at cracking the champagne and like celebrating things so we're actually almost too far in the opposite way where we're trying to like okay we need to celebrate more yeah. uh, along the way i mean it can be good for morale to like get the team out for something i feel like that's that's a good way to use it yep yeah, fully agree. I think that's what, uh, well, no, just us two, we, we both operate on like a very similar, I don't know what that would be called, like similar low key personality. Like we yeah. just, yeah, didn't expect celebrations or like recognition of like, we just accomplished it. Was like, yeah, we did that. And like, there's 20 more things to do. So we're just going to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Do you ever have somebody that like works, you know, like a nine to five, uh, like, you know, they ask what you're doing and you're like, well, you know, I got all this work to do. I'm just, you know, trying to, you know, get through it. And they're like, well, hope it's over soon. And you just want to be like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> over? What, what yeah, is that over that they're talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't understand. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, you, you know, <laughs> when you get done, you're finding the next thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the whole concept for me of like, uh, yeah, like work hours is not at all part of what would be considered normal. Uh, it's, it's funny how that works. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's definitely. I feel like I kind of, I kind of wax and wane with it. Like, you know, I mean, before we started recording, you asked me about all nighters, and I mean, you know, we've known each other for years, so I must have told you about like a bunch I pulled in the past, and that's why you asked me about that. But, um, I mean, I don't know. I've never really opened up about this on the podcast, but for people listening, like, I used to pull a lot of all-nighters. And, you know, I mean, I, I think part of it came from, like, you know, going to Carnegie Mellon and, you know, the culture there sort of values that sort of thing. And, you know, you've got this, you know, hustle culture. And I don't know. I've kind of balanced the other direction. I mean, I still work, you know, pretty long hours compared to the average person. Like, maybe, 
you know, like 10 to 12 hours a day during the week, like around eight on a Saturday and then maybe like two to four on a Sunday is like typically my, my working schedule. But I mean, it's nowhere near what I used to do. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm balancing out, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. There's definitely got to be, uh, we were talking about it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of all nighters. I don't know how you pulled that off. Yeah. Like, that was impressive. In like a good way and also a bad way, I guess. No, at the I, same was, time, I was destroyed but, my body and myself. Was... I um, I definitely am glad I'm not doing that anymore. I, I resolved maybe like uh, eh, around a year ago to stop doing that. So I, I haven't pulled one since. Nice. Yeah. Hope you nice. can keep it up. I'm sure I'll need to at some point, but I mean, for the most part, I just try to not have to. So, you know, a lot of it just comes down to building healthier habits and planning better so you don't have to do that. So. You know, waking up earlier, getting cardio, you know, um, trying to tie yourself out so you're more tired at night. Yeah. Realizing that, you know, if you set contingency, you know, then a lot of times you do have the next day. And I mean, I, I told you about something I was working on now where I'm kind of up against the deadline. Like, oh, you got to pull out. I'm like, no, I still have till, yeah. you know, a week from, ne- you know, over a week from now to do it. But or I guess it's about a week from now now. But, you know, it's, I think it's just part of, you know, getting more mature is, you know, you just get better at not killing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like when you're, when you're super young, you can kind of get away with just, you know, yeah. not sleeping and, and running on adrenaline all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Now it's a lot more front loading, planning it out well for yeah. the sleeping thing, like watching caffeine in the afternoon. For me, that's yeah. always been one. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. For me, just the cardio was a big thing. Like that's, that's been really helpful. I, I got into tennis, like maybe about, um, like about maybe like a year and a half ago, I, I started playing tennis and that's been really fun. Nice. Yeah. I love tennis. Are you uh, joining dude, the, you want to play? Let's do it. <laughs> Let's yeah. Get a game going. Do you know, yeah. uh, Joel plays tennis as well. Yeah. Yeah. He whooped my ass last time I played him. Joel Reed for people listening is a better tennis player than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need, played him? No, I need to play him at some point. Apparently his wife, Tina is the one to beat. Like she's at least Joel, like says she's like way better than him. So, I mean, I've got a long way to go before I can take on Tina, but... <laughs> but you'll get there steps at a time. Yeah. What, two years you'll be taking on Tina? I, you know, I mean, we'll she's see. getting better, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess they do play along. Yeah. yeah, they have, like, court reservations in the yeah, winter and for the I, bubble. I think and... Joel just bought, like, a, I think, what is it, like, 7.30 on Sundays is their time in the bubble? I think that's wow. it. Yeah, and then Joel just bought, like a, like, a tennis ball serving machine. Oh, and wow. so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're grilling. They're so, grilling. So they're, they're their rate better. of progression is about to start uh, getting even faster. Yeah, yeah. Or, or at the very least, like, they're healthily, you know, maintaining skill, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's um, I don't know. I, I, I have, I've only played a few times this season, although I think I'm still getting better. I, um, I had, like, my closest match with a guy that I've had a rivalry with for a while, but he always beats me. And I came really close to beating him, um, like, last weekend. So I was kind of proud of that, just giving him a fight for it. Nice. Um, yeah. There's someone else I played with recently uh, where I, I was able to win. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, you know, kind of just getting back into it. I've only been playing for about a year and a half now. And so I'm not – and I skipped the whole winter season, um, you know, and, and sort of switched to rock climbing. And so – I've, um, you know, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. When do you usually play? Do you play like mornings, afternoons, evenings? Yeah, normally mornings on the weekend. Nice. But uh, my definition of play lately, um, don't know if it can really count as play. My girlfriend's also picking up tennis. Nice. And so it's a lot of, um, yeah, rallying with her. But uh, because she's just picking it up, um, yeah, I wouldn't call it full on playing for me. Yeah, it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she'll like new people get the hang of it pretty quick like i'll play with like a total noob sometimes and like i feel like by the end of the two hour session or whatever like i mean they can hit the ball back at least you know and so you know yeah like she can do she, she's actually gotten pretty good i'm surprised sometimes like usually at the end because like i want to just like hit harder shots we have like this deal where i can just like hit hard top spin shots at her and like do more like things that i want to do that i won't do to her when i'm actually rallying <laughs> uh and she's she's very very cool with it which is nice and that's always fun because i can kind of get that out of my system at the beginning but the first section we're playing it's kind of like all right soft shot here try to not put too much spin on it like normally i like to like backspin or slice my my backhands and I have to fight like every urge in my body not to do it when it's like a low backhand because I know if I do that it's not going to come back over the net. It's be like, <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's pretty funny. 
but yeah it's actually uh joel and i we went to play and joel happened to be playing at the same court i think it was last summer uh so we we've actually been playing on the same court but we just never played each other yet yeah, yeah. i i've played i played with joel at the uh the elder dice courts um like the one time i played him and he just steamrolled me really bad like it was it was i don't want to say humiliating because he's just he's been playing longer than me but one of these days, I'll uh, I'm gonna train and train and train, you know, and get. Yeah, it'll be like the Rocky story. I'll get swole, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Joe's the, Joe's the guy you're going up against. It's like the da 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I um, I definitely should probably start taking lessons again. Do you do you ever do lessons or? No, I probably should. Uh, my game's probably been pretty stagnant. I can recommend a, a coach time. or two if you want. Yeah, I'd be, yeah I'd I'm be not going to say that on the air because I don't do want to bottleneck. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. If you want tennis coaches, email Spencer directly. <laughs> yeah, if somebody asked me via email, I would have trouble saying no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't, I don't want to because, I mean, I have enough trouble getting lessons with these guys already. And so, yeah, <laughs> so you appointment in the other direction. Don't go to this guy. <laughs> go to this person. Yeah, well, there's there's two guys I go to, and one's named Mark and one's named Mike. And if you know their last names, then you already know who they are, and you don't need me. But um, Mark is like kind of a bit of a hippie. Like he's he's kind of awesome. He's got like long hair, and he just is like he like teaches like middle school and high school tennis and. He sounds like a high school or middle school tennis teacher when he's teaching you as an adult. Like, it's kind of yeah. hilarious. He's like, there you go. That's the way. Come on. You know? He's, he's like, Very real encouraging. encouraging. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think uh, Joel and Tina actually go to him. And then the other guy is, is like the CMU coach, uh, the guy named Mike. And he's like a little bit more like, um, you know, like kind of soft spoken and low key uh i like them both like they're both awesome coaches uh it's it's i like kind of going to both of them actually because i feel like you know you sort of learn one thing from the one guy and a different thing from the other guy my yeah. dad gave me crap for that because he's like one of them's gonna screw up you know like <laughs> they're gonna conflict with each other and you know one will screw up the other one's lesson i'm like i don't know like yeah yeah you get to see both sides you become a more uh what's the right word like well-rounded more, uh, yeah like well-rounded more div- not diverse but like yeah like multifaceted you can adapt to different styles different play yeah for sure yeah i definitely um i definitely have a long way to go though uh i really need to work on my serve that's probably my weakest area right now so i mean it's just reps and you know so yeah yeah Yeah. lots of reps for the serve lots of good wrist snapping how'd you get yours down like just practicing at the yeah i think uh so i started playing I don't remember I started playing, but I played in high school. And so it was a lot of reps. And then I really like putting spit on my serves. So I don't do like a flat serve where you kind of serve it in front and then kind of flat rack it. Serve. I do it more like, yeah, above me. And I like try to catch over the top. Um, but then sometimes if you want more speed and you do that, you lose some of the speed when you try to do that. So I'll then put a little bit further out and try to just smack it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been trying to nail the kick serve and I definitely am horrible at it. And then I can... I can flat serve all right. I, I started putting like a little bit more speed on it in that last match than I normally do, and I had pretty good results with that. Just yeah. kind of trusting that it was going to go where I wanted it to. I th- it's almost like a leap of faith. Like you have to just kind of let go of knowing it's going to land in and just like fucking. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a good second serve? Um, my second serve is horrible. My second serve is is very easy to counter. <laughs> gotcha. Because you can get a if you get to a point where you're pretty like comfortable with the second serve, it really opens things up for the first serve because you can you feel a lot. Oh, less that's pressure. interesting. Yeah. So if you know you can land the second serve eighty percent of the time, then yeah, you're gonna that makes sense. Open it up for the first. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe even more than eighty. If you're like ninety percent confident, or I don't know how high you'd have to be. But yeah, and usually when you start serving and warming up, do you warm up your second serve first and then go to your first serve? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I do, do not. You, oh, that's you that go what you straight do? to first serve. Yeah, I normally try to start second serve because that like builds the confidence. Okay, that's there. It's also usually slower, so it's easier for warming up. Yeah. And then I, once I have that down, then I'm like, all right, baseline's good. And then it's all right, time for the first serve. <laughs> and then some days it's great. Like first serves like over fifty percent. Other days it's just it doesn't click in first serves like 20 30 percent okay well that's good to know yeah. that even it sounds like you're probably a better player than me <laughs> i've been doing i don't want to play that's the only way to find out yeah sure <laughs> i'm down let's do it <laughs> this summer let's go yeah i'm in i'm in 
Yeah, weekends. Uh, I try to. I try to like. It's kind of part of my initiative to be nicer to myself. I try not to like get up until a little bit later. Weekdays, I'll play it like six thirty a.m. You know, um, just to get it in before you know my first meeting. And I, I find when I do that, um, like my work day goes a lot smoother. Like I, I'm, I'm just. You know, it's it's weird. Like sometimes I'll get up, and you know, you drag your ass out of bed at you know like. 5 30 or whatever and yeah you know it's it kind of sucks and you're like ah, i'm gonna go back to sleep after i play this game you know and then you get to the court and you, your blood starts pumping and you're you're hitting them and you're like i am gonna have a great day yeah, yeah. <laughs> got the endorphins going yeah exactly going. yeah and you're not you're not going to sleep after that <laughs> no, no. how often do you play um for a while like last season i was going five or six times a week I do not have the time to do that right now. Uh, maybe it's just discipline. Like I could sleep less and wake up earlier and do it. But yeah, it's, I don't know. Sleep probably takes priority. Yeah, tennis, that's at least it. in my mind. Well, they're both important, I think. And it's it's easy to to say you need the sleep and then never wake up and play. When you set a game early and then you're forced to wake up for that, I found like that's kind of a good way to get. But then you're right. Sometimes you know it's just it's just too much. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, like it's the difference of. Uh, good sleep and tennis three times a week versus bad sleep and tennis six times a week i'd probably pick the former yeah yeah for sure but yeah now these days i i maybe i'm going like once or twice a week so i i probably should start going more i just need to figure out the time yeah yeah my thing uh, i started running i've like always nice. hated running but that's like the for how me did you get into faster it? how did i get into it I don't know if I'd really say I'm into it yet either. I'm. Uh, I still. I still hate it. Don't really enjoy it. It was just more out of a necessity, because like. To Do you play... still get that feeling you get after you play in the morning, where like if you run, you just you're just like ready to kick the day's rear. Yeah, yeah. To be That's honest, cool. I don't usually run much during the weekdays. <laughs> it's usually like a weekend kind of morning run, but like whenever yeah. I'm done running, it's like yeah, the day's good. Anytime for me, it's just like. I think I normally start work around like 7.30 most days. Anytime I start earlier than that, even if I didn't exercise, I just have that weird feeling like, all right, I'm ready to like take the day on. There's just something about like going in really early that I don't know why, but just like yeah, jazzes I, me up. I'm kind of better if I have a reason I have to do it. So it's kind of a bad habit and I'm not proud of this, but oftentimes I'll like wake up in time for my first meeting or commitment. So the way around that is just to set an early meeting or commitment. <laughs> so, <laughs> True. And so, you know, that, I mean, that's how you like, I mean, I don't know. Um, so I, I had to get some materials for a project one time. And this was during the pandemic. And the only place that had the materials I needed that was anywhere close was Ohio. And I timed it out where I could still make like a 1030 a.m. meeting in Pittsburgh's north side if I headed out at like 3.30 a.m. Oh, geez, and wow. Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact logistics, but it was something like that. And, I mean, I had to like go to the place, buy what I needed, you know, like strap it to the car, drive back, you know, drop it at the office, go to the meeting. And so I I, I just was jazzed. Like it was, it was yeah. I, I felt like a sense of urgency and, well, not urgency, but like purpose and, you know, I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do all this. And I, you know, I woke up, made myself breakfast, which I never do. You know, I was like nice, super, yeah. super jazzed. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's an early trip. I think yeah. for me, what really changed my work schedule, I used to be like more of like a nine o'clock person, is once we sold to the Netherlands and you interact with the Netherlands a lot, uh, you just, yeah, because they're six hours ahead, you, it's like all morning meetings. That makes and so sense. if you can be in the office at seven or 7.30 or eight, it opens up a lot more time. Uh, for meetings yeah that makes a lot of sense no. so it'll be there one thirty or 2 if I remember my basic arithmetic yep nice yeah, <laughs> yeah and then you also find usually uh, people in the Netherlands don't work uh, don't work late like we do here Most oh that's them, interesting yeah. some of them do some of the people I talk to will still be working way late but I think they're a little bit better at the like time Work-life hits balance yeah checking out yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting um I mean, it seems like that culture changes everywhere. Like, Australians seem like they're better at that, too. I think they have, what, like, six weeks of vacation that they get, like, standard. Do they? Wow. Yeah. Nice. And so, it's int- I, we have a client in New Zealand um, where I um, was recently working. Well, it was, it's 
the U.S. New Zealand split their operations, and so we were working with the U.S. office, and then we recently started working with the New Zealand office, and like those guys, you know, I was like trying to set a meeting, and um, <laughs> my U.S. point of contact, you know, kind of warned me. He's like, "Don't let them trick you. If they want a meeting Monday, that's your Sunday." <laughs> so, oh, yeah. that's a good warning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's 16 hours forward, so um, to to get to them. So I what I do is I go to the next day and I subtract eight hours, and so you yeah. know, like like they come online at our 4 p.m. like the next day, which is their 8 a.m. Jeez. And so yeah. That's actually, I, I had sort of a moment of brilliance when I was trying to open up communications with the New Zealand office. I was really proud of this. I um, was having trouble, you know, just getting a hold of these guys. I, get, I mean, we're all really busy, right? And so yeah. you're, you're trying to talk to, a, you know, a vendor for the first time. I mean, you know, being them and, you know, it's like, you know, it's, you know a million emails, you know, like yeah. I was already. And so I, I was like up at like 10, 11 p.m. on a Sunday and I'm just thinking like, oh, you know, I did the math and I'm like, this is their Monday morning. Like I should just, you know, midday Monday and they have U.S. operations. So half their company I don't, I don't know what the split is but like a great percentage of the company probably isn't bugging them right now yeah, like, Ooh, i bet i could chance. get it yeah exactly this is my opportunity <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> i emailed the one guy from new zealand and sure enough he emails back right away nice. and i was like yeah i was just so proud that's a good trick yeah thanks i just thought of it yeah um but then um i just remember setting the meeting right like there were like you know Good Friday was a national holiday, so we had to work around that. And uh, yep. Yep. It was like a bunch of, you know, and I'm Jewish, so I didn't realize what that was. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, Netherlands. I think we're in Canada, Netherlands. In Canada, Good Friday is a national holiday. In the Netherlands, it's not. But then in the Netherlands, the Monday was a national holiday. Oh, that's in interesting. Canada, it was not. So we had both like, uh, all right. We'll New Zealanders had both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, all these international differences, holidays. It's so cool, though, to, like, so much more work to be deployed on multiple, like, countries, but it's pretty cool to think about, like, wow, like, yeah. we're feeding Europeans, we're feeding Canadians, we're feeding Americans. That's awesome. Like, well, and the cultural differences are fun, too. Like, I, I've always enjoyed, you know, getting to know people from a bunch of different places. Yeah, definitely. It's, the to be honest, the Canadians are pretty similar to us, so that one's not as exciting. Yeah, that's a good point. But, yeah, <laughs> going, to, going to, like, the Netherlands is pretty sweet. Uh yeah, Dutch people. I'm a fan. Yeah, Dutch people are cool. I I, I enjoy visiting the Netherlands. Um, still still got friends in Rotterdam from uh, nice. Yeah, a few yeah. visits ago. So I really 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 like it there. Actually, one of the people to test drive this robotic demo in the office uh, is was in Rotterdam. Yeah, very cool. So Rotterdam's yeah. such a neat city too. It really is it beautiful. Like, it's like half old, half new from the bombings. It's like all the old <laughs> stuff that survived is still there, and all the things that got destroyed in the bombings are like built up new. Yeah, well, and some of the new architecture is just really novel there too. Like, I feel like those guys have like a different way of thinking about a lot of stuff, and so yeah, like there's yeah, there's just some really awesome culture in, in that part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I love like The Hague, Delft, Rotterdam, that yeah. whole like section there. Yeah. Not to mention like just all the ports and like coastal stuff you see when you're out there. Like it's it's just really, really beautiful and like the bicycle culture is really good oh, there. Yeah. So good. Yeah. <laughs> More bikes than people. Yep. <laughs> Canals everywhere. Bikes oh, yeah. all over the street. They're actually right now they're trying to make it so that cities don't allow cars in. They're trying to make it so, like, the insides of the cities are all just for pedestrians and bikers. Huh. That's going to be interesting as, like, an international traveler trying to get into the... I guess you'll just have to, like, have a folding bike in your trunk or something. And you get to a certain point, you park the car, you get the bike. Yep. Yeah. yeah go where you got to go. Walk. Get back on the bike, park the car, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I bought a folding bike a while ago, um, and the fantasy uh, that I haven't done yet, but it's it's a fantasy is that I can keep it in the trunk of my car and um, I actually got to put it in my new car. I, I had a oh, new yeah. car and I've had it just kind of docked for a while. But um, the fantasy is I can find like a really beautiful overpass or a trail when I'm driving and just get out of the car and, and bike it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a folding bike, so I'll fit in the trunk of a sedan. But yeah, I got to throw that in my trunk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Weather's getting nice. You can pop out and, and do it soon. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I do have the tennis racket in the car, so I can always play a game. <laughs> oh, nice. Balls, too? Or just uh, yeah, yeah, I got the balls. Nice. 
<laughs> Do you go to Tennis Village? Uh, I get most of my balls from the Rite Aid where I live because it's just fast. Or nice. yeah, makes sense. from Costco. Costco sells like tennis balls? Sometimes. I got it once from Costco. But whenever I need like my racket restrung, I'll go to Tennis Village. Yeah, it makes sense. They have a better price on balls than Amazon. And it's like, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> really? Yeah, Tennis Village, like the balls are like, like I don't know. I want to say it was like, it wasn't nothing. It was like 20, 30% cheaper than Amazon, like last I checked. Wow, impressive. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So, I don't know. I've been thinking about getting a new racket too. My, my racket is my mom's old racket, and it says like Prince Copyright 1990. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so i feel like i'm probably due for an upgrade um but it's also a sweet racket i'm like i don't know if i'm like a good enough player to justify getting a better one yet but then one of my friends let me play with like a yonix racket that he had the other day and it was just like it definitely felt better i was like oh this is way more modern yeah because <laughs> in the last 33 years they've innovated these things a bit yeah just a tad yeah <laughs> i think my racket's probably 13 years old now but uh yeah i should get a new one one day but uh yeah i'm not in the same realm as you i'm not 1990s you should definitely get a new mine one. is 1990 yeah so like, oh 90 yeah oh yeah it's that can be a good backup racket you're getting to the point where you're so good old. you need two rackets you need your primary right and then you have your backup for if you when you break a string during the match or if you run into somebody that wants to play and they don't have a racket exactly yeah and yeah. you give them do you give them the good one or the bad one Oh, give them the bad one every time. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I think it would depend who it is. If it's, my, if it's someone, yeah, I'd say it depends on the skill and balance. I'd probably just yeah, pick that makes sense. Whoever is uh, whoever is more skilled gets the worst racket. Yeah, yeah I think that's <laughs> fair. I, I, I'm so new to the game. I feel like I need every advantage I can get right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I used to play when I was like in middle school, but like not since then until last, you know, a year and a half ago. So gotcha. Okay, so you at least had like some foundation that was already there. Yeah, luckily. So I, I sort of found it again through like lessons and and just repetitions. But I don't know. I definitely I definitely have a long way to go to get good at it again. Yeah, it's fun though. It's a fun path. I feel like sometimes. Uh... In the very beginning, that's when it's the most fun before things get too complicated because you can just kind of keep rallying back and forth um, versus like at some point, like people just get really good at kill shots. Like if you don't, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't hit like a hard enough shot, they can just return and it's like, yeah, I can't play that. You ever like play against like an old guy that's just amazing at kill shots? No, I haven't done that. Yeah. There's uh there's like a 70 year old lawyer I play against sometimes who's a friend of mine and, um, he like can't move very fast, but he's been playing for longer than I've been alive, and so he's he's like epic at kill shots. <laughs> so right. he knows the court movements. So will always be at the right spot. He might not move fast, but he can predict it from you, so he gets extra time. Yeah, I've never beat him. You and I probably up. yeah, I probably won't. Yeah. I mean, I might if I keep you know practicing at it. But he he's hilarious. Like. Um, you know, he's like, you know, when we lose, you can buy me mini. When you lose, you can buy me mini O's. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll nice. buy it anyway, just to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> he won't rub, rub salt in the wound. Yeah, no, he's, he's a really sweet guy. But, That's cool. Yeah. My, my dad was telling me about like a guy he used to play against when he was in school who was like 80 or 90, who was the same way, like couldn't move fast, but could hit it where you can't. <laughs> so. It's impressive. Those people, like, they got the angles down perfectly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, strategic. Yeah. I'm try I'm getting better at that, right? I mean, like, when you know where you're hitting and you sort of, like, if, if you catch the other person on, on, like, a corner, you just hit to, the, like, deep on the other side. I mean, that's that's pretty good, I found. Yeah. Are you at the point where you're, uh, you're strategic about which side of the court? And are you at the point, too, where you're also strategic about deep or shallow in the court like are you are you on quadrants yet or are you on like uh left and right so i'm more on left and right and then i always try to go deep and so i, I usually don't try to hit shallow um i have one friend i play against where he's um pretty um good at volleying and because i've got a weak second serve oh, he'll run up to the he net rushes the net after oh. yeah yeah exactly he'll mac and row it and so i'll try to um to get it uh, 
I, I actually, from watching the U.S. Open, <laughs> I found out about lobs, and I, I'll, I'll lob it over him now <laughs> like nice. when he does that. <laughs> yeah, and if you've perfected your lob, then you've, you've uh, yeah, you've, uh, what's the right word? Um, like, space on the right word, but like you basically like negated his biggest strength. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that I was really proud of that when I figured that out, and I've been just playing against this guy because he still does that move a lot. Like, I, I've just been getting better at my lob just from playing him. Nice. <laughs> so yeah. I see him doing it, and I'll lob it. So, like, you know, he'll be on the um, whatever the opposite of the ad side is, like the standard side, and he'll rush the net, and then I'll hit it deep in the ad side with a lob, and then he won't be able to do anything about it. Nice. So. <laughs> yeah, my lob game is not very good. That's one thing I have to improve still. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like serves are definitely higher priority than lobs. So. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who you're playing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, with him, if you just lob it all day long, it's like, oh, this isn't this is easy. Yeah, he doesn't rush the net every time, but he pretty much does it like on like maybe fifty percent of my second serves. It's like a yeah. decent amount of the time. So you can almost like purposefully bait him to like come to the net, so you can lob him, and then he doesn't get in. You just do it over and over again until he just. That is a good idea because he's not hitting a strong shot when he rushes like that, because he's spending most of his time running, and so he'll kind of whack it back slow. Which gives me time to line up a lob. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Like, All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> My second serve is actually an advantage now. Yeah. <laughs> Till he figures it out, you know, and then yeah. I got to go to the next thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is he good at the baseline? If he's not very good at the baseline, and you're better baseline, you got it. I'd say we're we're pretty evenly matched at the baseline. Um, but he's definitely better at his volley game than I am. Like I, I'm not, I'm not like a volley like Mac and Row type player, you know. And he's, he's pretty good at like hitting it like to the side, so I can't do anything about it. Uh, yeah, like front opposite quadrant. Yeah. So. What do you What do you do with quadrants when you get better? Like, how do you do? You just go for like caddy corner from where the person's at, pretty much every time, or it depends a lot on kind of what where they just came from uh so if you like just in your case if you hit someone on like a really deep lob and they're like running back and they're hitting it most times i would say i'd probably just charge the net in that regard because their return back probably isn't going to be very good and then you just angle it off on the opposite side really shallow so there's just no way they can get it nice um, but if you're not at the net i gotta then, get better at that volley to the side yeah they're so fun when you get it right <laughs> like, and you're just like it just comes and you're just like oh and you just knock it and it's just right there and just, dude no it's, it's infuriating them. when someone else does that to yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is, that that is definitely awesome. very true um, but yeah if you're playing baseline then usually it depends but sometimes it can be beneficial if they're so far back to like do a, a drop shot on the cross corner to make them run up and then they'll usually barely uh, get there and if they barely get there they're usually not going to get a good hit and then if they can then get it back to you and you're in a good Hit position. It deep. You can just slam it really fast and deep to the opposite side. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I will I will keep that in mind next time I play. <laughs> it works really well if the person too, if you're like on if they're coming up to the this side and you're over here and they decide to cross court it. Or if you're even over here and they still cross court it, because then you have the hole down the line. Oh nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Which is usually what happens. That's if someone gets aggressive and they're actually going to try to do the kill shot on you, like the the kill shot volley, except they can't quite get the volley and they're like too slow. <laughs> so you can like get up there fast and then it's just gone. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, really cool. I'm glad we have that in common. I'm definitely, I definitely want to play you now, even though you'll probably whoop my ass. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, if it's uh, if it's today, maybe I don't know if I'd say whoop your ass. Maybe it could still be a good good game, but in a year, I think it'll be the other way. Because you're progressing, you'll be destroying me. Well, you act like I'm going to surpass you. I mean, I'm sure you're still getting better and at the very least not atrophying. Hopefully not atrophying, but I'm probably just like, yeah. yeah. I mean, you do. it does become harder to improve, I feel like, as you get better and better and better just because there's, you know. Yeah, it gets a little tougher. I'm also just not doing anything where I'd be getting better. I'm basically only playing with my girlfriend. It's kind of bad. I joined the Shenley Ladder League, but I've not actually played any games yet. Yeah, I need to join this. Is that the ten dollar one? Yeah, it's ten to? bucks. Yep. And then like it's because it's a ladder league. I guess the goal is to beat someone higher up on the ladder than you. Then you get their points. 
plus yours. And then if you beat somebody lower, you get 20 points added to yours. And then if you lose, you get all the games you won as your points. Mm. So, I don't know. It's kind of neat. It's right. it's like playful. But I, I don't know. I still feel I still feel weird. Like I'm, I have this inadequacy complex where I'm worried I'm not going to be good enough. And yeah, I have the same thing too. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's why I haven't joined the ladder league yet. I, I plan to do it this summer. But it's just Joel's like, a member. Yeah, he sent me all the info, so I need to, I need to join. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, because then they also do the other thing. It's like you must be what is it, like whatever the thing is like level three. And I'm like, hmm, am I level three? I Dad, I've never know. ranked myself. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm at least, I don't know. I, I think I'm probably better than some of the people in the league, but, like, not that many. <laughs> like, <laughs> Today. I could take at least Next one year, or two though. of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So any uh, any other stuff you want to kind of get into soon, like from a personal or a business perspective that you can talk about? Yeah, let's see. Things to get into. Um when we just talked about not saying what you want to do next. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Personal things I've gotten on a this weird trend where I'm getting into more like non-robotics, but like random kind of like crafty things. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So like I got really interested and I decided just one day that I was going to make my own shirt. So I just went out, got a sewing machine learned how to like create a, a stencil or not a stencil, but like a, a template for sewing, cut it all out, stitched it, sewed it up, made some mistakes stitching it for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> As you do. But it, it was kind of neat. And I have like my own black t-shirt that I made that I'll probably never wear out in public, but it's cool. Like, <laughs> hey, I made my own t-shirt. That's awesome. Uh, and then also like just doing like paintings, like um, my girlfriend's really into painting. So we have like canvases around and tons of paint. So one day I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to make a painting for myself. And I just nice. kind of like, made a little abstract painting which was kind of fun things that i think are really interesting right now there are like uh i got into 3d uh like modeling so things like blender oh, cool. uh, like unreal engine just for fun i think that stuff's pretty cool um and then of course with all like the generative ai i've been trying to catch up to speed on that because uh, we that don't stuff's interesting have you seen iliad yet no i haven't seen Iliad. do you know james turncheck no He's the chief architect at Forment. I've been I've been trying to get him to come on the podcast. He's he's a good dude. But Maybe I do know him then. I yeah. Right. Yeah, he, he yeah, he's got like a beard. Um Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's super friendly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. His his brother Matthew um started this company called Iliad that uses AI to kinda like you give it a really basic sketch and I'm gonna butcher it, so I'm sorry, Matthew. Like please correct me here. But it like somehow generates a 3D model by inference, like from your like you know stick figure or whatever you fed it. Oh, it's it's pretty wicked. I mean, like I I've only played with it a little bit, um, but I just kind of signed up for it and I got on the on the early release list. So it's been sort of fun to mess around with. That's cool. I have to check that out. I know I uh, I've been running Stable Diffusion myself on my machine. Oh, nice. I. Uh, Meta or I guess Facebook Research released this new like segment anything model which is pretty cool. Basically, it's not, not really applied to like 3D modeling, but it's for like instant segmentation and like annotating data sets. Oh, cool. It's really good at being able to just identify objects in the scene. Like it can't tell you what the object is, but it's really good at just like putting the instant segmentation on. This is an object. Oh, interesting. Um, so it makes data labeling much more efficient, uh, which is pretty cool. That's really neat. Uh, what's the other thing I've been messing with lately? I think those are the only two Gen AI. St- oh, of course, playing around with ChatGPT. Yeah, as we but, all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I was reading something at work today, and I, I could kind of see it. I'm like, somebody was a little too trigger happy with ChatGPT when they were writing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I recognize that series of like letters. This sounds probabilistically like a machine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just like, huh, interesting. Like at least, you know read it after yeah at least proofread it (laughs) yeah like there's like a lot of repetition and Uh, it's kind of hilarious though i mean there are some great things it can do like uh i this is kind of bad but i'll admit to it anyway i had it um write a um like a three-year plan for a james bond villain (laughs) yeah that was that was one of the funnier ones 
It was like, our goal is world domination, and we will achieve that by creating advanced weapons. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a legitimate plan to me. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> and then, like, the final goal at the end of, like, this, like, weapons program and, like, having an island base was just to defeat James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very singularly focused. It was pretty funny. <laughs> One of the first things I did with ChatGPT was back in, was it beginning of December of last year? I, uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to take ChatGPT to the real world. And that made it sound way cooler than what I actually did. But I was just like, if I were to fully ch- follow ChatGPT blindly, can it like become like a cook or a chef? Oh. And so like, if you had like that, I was just like asking for like different recipes. And I was just did like, you actually run them? Make it. I did. I, ra- I made it. it That's, was, I've had it make it recipes too. I never actually tried making them. Yeah. The, the first one I started with was uh, chocolate chip pancakes. So very simple. Hard to screw yeah. up. It was that they were very thick, very heavy pancakes, but That's they were good. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Awesome. It's probably just the average of a bunch of recipes, right? Like, I mean, it's... Yeah, I don't know how it... Well, I, I asked it for, like, the world's best fried chicken recipe, and it came back with, like, a recipe that I was like, that actually would be pretty good if you made it, like... Yeah, I think we yeah. did a, a bolognese one as well with ChatGPT, but we didn't make that one. We just made the original bolognese. Yeah, sense. It, it was pretty close. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't actually run any of the recipes that came up with, although that just sounds like a blast. <laughs> yeah, it was neat. I think now it's probably there's so many other kind of like crazy hypey things you can do with ChatGPT. Like, of all I had to write a love now. story about two of my coworkers is, is the other <laughs> one I did. Did you show it to them? I showed it to one of them, and then I told the other one about it uh, over lunch. And so I was up front. They both thought it was yeah. hilarious. Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, getting chat to be teeter stories. Uh, really in in the story, fun. I had them like fall in love in like a place that we worked at. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so it's like somewhat realistic, and I yeah. oh, okay. I was like, write a story about an engineering manager named X and a systems architect named Y that fall in love at the Z laboratory. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it just it was hilarious. It like came up with the whole template. And, nice. Yeah, it was, it was like, you know, it had like a hook and, you know, there was like ups and downs. And oh, wow. It was, it was pretty funny. Follows the classic archetype. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, was, that was good. And then I, I had to do another one with one of my coworkers where I had it, right? Um, you know, this particular person really likes um, Johnny Walker uh, Blue Label. Oh, so yeah. I, I had it write a story about a cat um, with his name that really likes Johnny Walker Blue Label. And is also an electrical engineer. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's some expensive taste. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that cat was really living at large. <laughs> yep. <laughs> In the story, the cat would just like sip Johnny Walker Blue Label and roll around. <laughs> so, what a life. Yeah, it was pretty funny. And, and like do electrical engineering stuff. I think, I think it was... In the story, like the arc was that like there was a problem with the city's power grid, and the cat saved the day by like figuring it out while <laughs> so, drinking Johnny Walker. While drinking Johnny Walker, <laughs> like perfect branding. Yeah, is, yeah. Is Johnny Walker going to sponsor you in the next episode? I hope so. I mean, <laughs> I take some Blue Label if someone's willing to pitch it in. <laughs> That's one thing. Like, it's gonna not to disparage, but like I, I feel like I, I get diminishing returns at that dollar amount for the money. Yeah, like I've had it, but I'm like I don't think I would buy this <laughs> like for myself. Yeah. Yeah, unless you just had like so much money, and it's like yeah. But, but even, even then, then it's like it's, on so much cooler. I don't things. think it's better than you know, like yeah. yeah, like I've had like a good bottle that's like fifty dollars, and yeah, true. yeah, I don't, I I don't like, think it tastes much better at like six times that. Yeah, have you ever had Old Elk? Old Elk, not yet. Yeah, I enjoy that one. It's uh, like from this a was like a forty-five dollar bottle. Oh, sorry. No worries. Yeah, yeah, this is good, right? It's not yeah. bad. It's got a very different, cool flavor to it than than I'm used to in like a rye whiskey. Yeah, I've really been liking, like, there's a lot of good stuff you can get for, like, under 50 bucks a bottle. That's, like, definitely pretty pretty good. Yeah, this one I like. Um, I've been getting, like, Angel's Envy I really like. Um, oh, yeah. Basil Hayden, just for, like, stand-ins that are, like, pretty yeah. much decent every time. Basil Hayden's a good, like, just yeah. easy. Yeah, their, their rye is a little weird. Their bourbon's really good. Their rye is, like, it's, like, a little too sweet for my taste. It still tastes delicious, but... Yeah. Gotcha. I don't think I've tried their rye. I think I've only had the bourbon from them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tried to have a bottle in the studio, but I uh, I depleted it. Too and then, fast. <laughs> yeah, the store near me. Well, I mean, we go through a lot of booze on this podcast, as anyone listening uh, or watching can attest to. Yeah. 
But, um, you know, I just got to buy a new new bottle. I like buying the 1.75 uh, liter one with that because it just, you know, it's better value for money and I'm cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. oh, I didn't know you could get that size Basil Hayden's. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not it's not unreasonable. It's like it's only like seventy bucks or something. So that's like, Jeez, yeah. Good yeah. economies of scale. Nice yeah. discounted pricing. Yeah, that's it. It's like decent value for money. You don't feel like you wasted a bunch of coin. What is old elk? Like around like Yeah, it's a brewery out of Fort Collins. Oh cool. And it's uh Yeah, it's kinda like a... I don't know how to describe it. It's just very, very smooth. Uh, it's surprising it's kind of like you know how if you want something to sip like a basil hayden's where it's not going to be like as like punching in your face yeah it's kind of like one of those it's like a nice similar to basil hayden's but i think it's got maybe a little bit more flavor oh nice than like your your traditional basil hayden's yeah the basil hayden kind of you're right it's it's smooth it's easy to drink but it's like nothing it's it's a good stand-in yeah yeah that's awesome there was another one I was thinking of, but it totally escaped me. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, there's so many out there. Oh, it's yeah, like, for sure. It's like never ending. My yep. dad got in this huge, like like many people during the pandemic, and a huge whiskey kick. And I think he literally has like two or three like wooden crates of unopened whiskey bottles in his <laughs> basement now. And like, he's got he's got his person who like hooks him up with like the, what is it, like uh, Lieutenant Colonel? Is that right? Taylor? Lieutenant Colonel? Yeah, Colonel Taylor. There. Yeah, I think Colonel Taylor... Whiskey, which yet. is hard to find. He has some Blanton's has been that. getting really hard to find. Blanton's, yeah, he had tons of Blanton's. Uh, That's he had cool. A whole, whole bunch of the, um, what's the? Wow, I can't believe it's based on Weller's. Whole bunch of like oh, Weller's, cool. the whole line from like the bottom shelf all the way to the top top shelf. That's awesome. But yeah, and uh, when I went back, so I was not super into whiskey. Still, I'm not crazy into whiskey, but I went back for Christmas and before having dinner, he pulled out like 15 different bottles, and we just did like. A whole flight of all 15. Oh, that's just awesome. Must have been wasted. A lot of that. whiskey. <laughs> yeah, like we did like, I think quarter, maybe half shot. So it wasn't yeah, as bad still. as it could have been. But it was, yeah, it was a it's lot. like five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, Bryston, who, uh, you know, you heard recently yeah. helping out with the tech on the podcast, um, doesn't drink. And so he sent me a text the other day and it was just a picture of a bottle of Dom Perignon from 1990. And he wrote, uh, would this be useful to you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, yes, it would. <laughs> That's very nice of you. Did you just find it? He's like, I'm not going to drink it here. Yeah, That's a friend gave it to him. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So thank you, Bryston. You're the yeah. best. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, it was incredibly kind of him. I'm like, you sure you don't want to sell that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of money. He's like, ah, I don't know how to sell booze. Yeah, just take it. Enjoy. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to plug or, or mention that's kind of coming up? Yeah, we have a couple job postings that is probably worth just plugging to check out the, the web page. Sure. Um, so what are you trying to hire for in particular? It'll be a senior robotics engineer. So someone who's really talented at motion planning kind of path planning kind of complex scenes Are you sponsoring visas i might have someone for you yes yeah. well, let's talk after <laughs> sounds good <Yeah. laughs> and then uh director of hardware engineering so somebody who's uh built and deployed profitable robots at scale nice yeah which is not easy to find in this industry There's oh yeah a lot sure. of uh, so it's almost like probably more like pack house uh robotics pack um, house robotics. Yeah, like in like uh, pack house facilities. So they're more like simpler machines where it's like optical sorters or um, things for like filtering food. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the only really major profitable like, pseudo robotic machines that have been made. Um, like the pneumatic sorters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like when you think of profitable robots, what, what companies or what machines come to mind? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> this is embarrassing. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think of who's actually earning money and building up based on that. <laughs> Maybe like iRobots Roomba comes to mind. Um, industrial robot arms, so like Fanuc, yeah. Kuka, Kamau, um, those come to mind. Um, I don't know. Would you consider a conveyance system to be a robot? 
Depends. Yeah, it's Maybe. Fair. It's close. <laughs> I'd say fair. it's a it's I would count it as a robot, but probably very simple. Well, is it just conveyance with no decision making? Like do things get moved from conveyor to conveyor? I mean you can do that, but not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the companies that make those ones also make dumb conveyors that just go from A to B. Yeah. In my mind then the dumb conveyor probably not because there's no like decision making. I mean, there's probably money in automated storage and retrieval systems, but I don't really know the math to back that up. Um, I don't know. I know AMR is pretty hyped right now, but I don't know how profitable it actually is. So yeah. that's that's a hard one to know for sure. Like, do you know like how Secret and Vecna and I'm not too sure BG are doing. <laughs> BG just got acquired, right? Or is going to be acquired? Did they? Yeah, I think uh, SoftBank is going to acquire them for three hundred some million. Holy moly! Million. That ain't bad. Yeah, they. I think. I think they spacked for two billion though two years ago. Ha. Huh. So okay, that, so that's kind of that like regard, a shrinkage. It's, it's not the greatest, but I think when they spacked, things were also very frothy. So it's yeah, expected. makes sense. <laughs> it's not necessarily on BG. It's just on that was the market, and so the market has changed. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know if they reached profitability. Yeah, I don't I think, know either. I think they're still burning a lot in their public statements. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've definitely got customers, but I don't know if it's enough to cover their burn. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's interesting. I think probably iRobot is probably the best one yeah. in my mind of like, yeah, that's really proven. Is like, a Would you consider Amazon a robotics company? Amazon Robotics, I think it's hard because they do so many different things that you have, I think, plenty of people at Amazon Robotics who might not be working on profitable machines, but there definitely are some people who have. Actually, one of our investors, uh, Pete Worman, was the co-founder and CTO of Kiva Systems. Oh, that's awesome. Which is, yeah, he's, he's pretty, pretty cool to talk with and get their experience of how they grew. Ask him to come on the podcast. Yeah, we will do. <laughs> Next time I see him. Awesome. Come chat with Spencer. Yeah, I appreciate it, Brandon. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. Who do you think of when you think of like profitable robotics companies? I think initially we were, I was thinking more kind of those pack house, uh, but that's also because we see pack house equipment a lot and we yeah. see there's a lot of it. I mean, there's the defense boys. Those come to mind. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, the only problem I think with defense, at least from not problem with defense, but like for us when we think about hiring, is defense usually has pseudo unlimited budgets <laughs> and kind of very flexible timelines which is not yeah. how uh, how we get to operate as a startup yeah it's true uh so in that regard yeah the probably the skill sets through defense my guess is are not always the same as the skill sets that we might need right now for like scaling something profitably yeah. and scaling it in a tight timeline yeah if you're just looking for robotics engineers like why do you need somebody that's worked on a profitable robot like i mean i, I get that ideally you'd want somebody with that track record uh, of yeah, yeah. market success but yeah when... for for senior robotics engineer doesn't matter like that whole thing everything we just talked about forget about it it's all about like how good's the motion planning and algorithm that's creation. what i would think but for the director of hardware that's the person gotcha. who's like we're looking for at least the semblance or kind of something around that track record that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, we're we're just gonna start recruiting for that role, so we'll see. That's interesting. I mean, I feel like with that with a role like that, there's only so many folks you can hire, and so it's it's kind of a. I mean, yeah, I think you probably already know kind of your target acquisition strategy. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, it'll, we'll see. I think there's a. I think there's gonna be a couple areas that have very similar skill sets that we not, might not realize at the moment. Yeah. Um. Like I remember I was talking to the one of the recruiters at Tesla a while ago and he was telling me about how when they were recruiting for someone to do some of the plastic molding for cars and like automotive, he kept going through Canada after Canada and they couldn't find the skill set they needed. <clears throat> and then he started looking at Barbies and he found the person huh. who was running the Barbie facility and factories and like that person had exactly the skill set they needed that's interesting and so i think there's probably some of the some some stuff like that how do you think to look to the barbie person i wonder i don't know i don't know how he thought to do that but it was a very clever idea because yeah it is a completely different field that nobody would think of that he's probably not even looking for jobs in automotive because he doesn't even think that his skills apply but at the core like it's exactly the the main skill set they need yeah you're trying to drive costs down yeah yeah, I mean, I would, I would think there would be some differences between Teslas and Barbies, but yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, just a, just a little bit. Maybe but when not. it comes to the plastic formation, <laughs> yeah, 
Have you talked to Rich Jocknowitz about injection molding ever? No. That guy's a nerd when it comes to that stuff, like, yeah. in a good way. Like, uh, he's... Do you know who he is? No. He's the uh, senior director of uh, product operations and engineering at 4Moms. And he, I mean, he's done some injection molded parts. Yeah. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. There's, there's a profitable robot is the Mamaru. It's like their cash yeah, That's cow. a good point. Yeah. Yeah, 4Moms yeah, did make it happen. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe um, if, I mean, this is kind of a fun, you know, little, like, you know, brain search. What about uh, Thorne's other company, like Athon? Like, didn't they? They seem like they're doing all right, at least in, on paper. Yeah, I think I, Athon is profitable now. It's what, ST Engineering? I, I didn't see they got acquired by those. I mean, they've been acquired a lot, though, right? right? Wasn't it Athon, McKesson, Omnicell, now ST Engineering? I think you had um, Sean McDonald, I think, started... I forgot automated healthcare and I forgot who else he started with, but Aldo Zini came in early, I think is the VP of sales and they were acquired by McKesson and then they eventually left and then started Athon separately. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't and realize that. Athon, I think was acquired by ST engineering a few years ago. Interesting. I did not realize that. Yeah. But yeah, I think Athon is, is one of the groups that's, that's made it happen. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking for a job in robotics and you're a director of hardware or you were a director of hardware at a company making robots profitably, uh, reach out to four growers for their new director of hardware position. Um, senior software engineer, uh, robotics software engineer. Uh, also, reach out to four growers for that position. Um, anything else you want to plug the tail end? No, I think it's just been a, a lot of fun. Thanks, Spencer, uh, for having me on the pod. And uh, yeah, to anyone watching, uh, you know, we build robots that feed the world. And if that's something you're interested in, something you want to be a part of, uh, check out our website and uh, definitely apply to some of the positions. Awesome. And my commercial will roll after this. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again, and see you on the next one.